Section 19 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 16. It was the noon of the day on which Sidonia was to leave the castle. The wind was high, the vast white clouds scudded over the blue heaven, the leaves yet green and tender branches snapped like glass, were whirled in eddies from the trees, the grassy sward undulated like the ocean with a thousand tints and shadows. From the window of the music-room Lucretia Colonna gazed on the turbulent sky. The heaven of her heart, too, was disturbed. She turned from the agitated external world to ponder over her inward emotion. She uttered a deep sigh. Slowly she moved towards her harp. Wildly, almost unconsciously, she touched with one hand its strings while her eyes were fixed on the ground. An imperfect melody resounded, yet plaintive and passionate. It seemed to attract her soul. She raised her head, and then touching the strings with both her hands, she poured forth tones of deep yet thrilling power. I am a stranger in the halls of a stranger. Ah, whither shall I flee? To the castle of my fathers in the green mountains, to the palace of my fathers in the ancient city. There is no flag on the castle of my fathers in the green mountains. Silent is the palace of my fathers in the ancient city. Is there no home for the homeless? Can the unloved never find love? Ah, thou fliest away, fleet cloud. He will leave us swifter than thee. Alas, cutting wind, thy breath is not so cold as his heart. I am a stranger in the halls of a stranger. Ah, whither shall I flee? The door of the music-room slowly opened. It was Sidonia. His hat was in his hand. He was evidently on the point of departure. Those sounds assured me, he said calmly but kindly, as he advanced, that I might find you here, on which I scarcely counted at so early an hour. You are going, then, said the princess? My carriage is at the door. The marquis has delayed me. I must be in London to-night. I conclude more abruptly than I could have wished one of the most agreeable visits I ever made and I hope you will permit me to express to you how much I am indebted to you for a society which those should deem themselves fortunate who can more frequently enjoy. He held forth his hand, she extended hers, cold as marble, which he bent over, but did not press to his lips. Lord Monmouth talks of remaining here some time, he observed, but I suppose next year, if not this, we shall all meet in some city of the earth." Lucretia bowed, and Sidonia, with a graceful reverence, withdrew. The Princess Lucretia stood for some moments motionless. A sound attracted her to the window. She perceived the equipage of Sidonia whirling along the winding roads of the park. She watched it till it disappeared, then, quitting the window, she threw herself into a chair and buried her face in her shawl. End of chapter 16 End of Book 4 Book 5, Chapter 1 A university life did not bring to Coningsby that feeling of emancipation usually experienced by freshmen. The contrast between school and college life is perhaps under any circumstances less striking to the Etonian than to others. He has been prepared for becoming his own master by the liberty wisely entrusted to him in his boyhood and which is, in general, discreetly exercised. But there were also other reasons why Coningsby should have been less impressed with the novelty of his life, and have encountered less temptations than commonly are met with in the new existence which a university opens to youth. In the interval which had elapsed between quitting Eton and going to Cambridge, brief as the period may comparatively appear, Coningsby had seen much of the world. Three or four months, indeed, may not seem, at first blush, a course of time which can very materially influence the formation of character. But time must not be counted by calendars, but by sensations, by thought. Coningsby had felt a good deal, reflected more. He had encountered a great number of human beings, offering a vast variety of character for his observation. 
It was not merely manners, but even the intellectual and moral development of the human mind which in a great degree, unconsciously to himself, had been submitted to his study and his scrutiny. New trains of ideas had been opened to him, his mind was teeming with suggestions. The horizon of his intelligence had insensibly expanded. He perceived that there were other opinions in the world besides those to which he had been habituated. The depths of his intellect had been stirred. He was a wiser man. He distinguished three individuals whose acquaintance had greatly influenced his mind. Eustace Lyle, the elder Millbank, above all, Sidonia. He curiously meditated over the fact that three English subjects, one of them a principal landed proprietor, another one of the most eminent manufacturers, and the third the greatest capitalist in the kingdom, all of them men of great intelligence and doubtless of a high probity and conscience, were in their hearts disaffected with the political constitution of the country. Yet unquestionably these were the men among whom we ought to seek for some of our first citizens. What then was this repulsive quality in those institutions which we persisted in calling national, and which once were so? Here was a great question. There was another reason also why Coningsby should feel a little fastidious among his new habits, and without being aware of it, a little depressed. For three or four months, and for the first time in his life, he had passed his time in the continual society of refined and charming women. It is an acquaintance which, when habitual, exercises a great influence over the tone of the mind, even if it does not produce any more violent effects. It refines the taste, quickens the perception, and gives, as it were, a grace and flexibility to the intellect. Coningsby, in his solitary rooms arranging his books, sighed when he recalled the Lady Everinghams and the Lady Theresa's, the gracious Duchess, the frank, good-natured Madame Colonna, that deeply interesting enigma, the Princess Lucretia, and the gentle Flora. He thought with disgust of the impending dissipation of a university which could only be an exaggeration of their coarse frolics at school. It seemed rather vapid, this mighty Cambridge, over which they had so often talked in the playing fields of Eton, with such anticipations of its vast and absorbing interest. And those university honours that once were the great object of his aspirations, they did not figure in that grandeur with which they once haunted his imagination. What Coningsby determined to conquer was knowledge. He had watched the influence of Sidonia in society with an eye of unceasing vigilance. Coningsby perceived that all yielded to him, that Lord Monmouth even, who seemed to respect none, gave place to his intelligence, appealed to him, listened to him, was guided by him. What was the secret of this influence? Knowledge. On all subjects his views were prompt and clear, and this not more from his native sagacity and reach of view, than from the aggregate of facts which rose to guide his judgment and illustrate his meaning, from all countries and all ages, instantly at his command. The friends of Coningsby were now hourly arriving. It seemed when he met them again that they had all suddenly become men since they had separated, Buckhurst especially. He had been at Paris and returned with his mind very much opened and trousers made in quite a new style. All his thoughts were how soon he could contrive to get back again, and he told them endless stories of actresses and dinners at fashionable cafés. Vere enjoyed Cambridge most because he had been staying with his family since he quitted Eton. Henry Sidney was full of church architecture, national sports, restoration of the order of the peasantry, and was to maintain a constant correspondent on these and similar subjects with Eustace Lyle. Finally, however, they all fell into a very fair, regular, routine life. They all read a little, but not with the enthusiasm which they had once projected. Buckhurst drove four in hand, and they all of them sometimes assisted him, but not immoderately. Their suppers were sometimes gay, but never outrageous, and among all of them the school friendship was maintained unbroken and even undisturbed. The fame of Coningsby preceded him at Cambridge. 
no man ever went up from whom more was expected in every way the dons awaited a sucking member for the university the undergraduates were prepared to welcome a new alcibiades he was neither neither a prig nor a profligate but a quiet gentlemanlike yet spirited young man gracious to all but intimate only with his old friends and giving always an impression of his general tone that his soul was not absorbed in his university and yet perhaps he might have been coddled into a prig or flattered into a profligate had it not been for the intervening experience which he had gained between his school and college life that had visibly impressed upon him what before he had only faintly acquired from books that there was a greater and more real world awaiting him than to be found in those bowers of academus to which youth is apt at first to attribute an exaggerated importance a world of action and passion of power and peril a world for which a great preparation was indeed necessary severe and profound but not altogether such a one as was now offered to him yet this want must be supplied and by himself coningsby had already acquirements sufficiently considerable with some formal application to ensure him at all times his degree he was no longer engrossed by the intention he once proudly entertained of trying for honours and he chalked out for himself that range of reading which digested by his thought should furnish him in some degree with that various knowledge of the history of man to which he aspired no we must not for a moment believe that accident could have long diverted the course of a character so strong the same desire that prevented the castle of his grandfather from proving a castle of indolence to him that saved him from a too early initiation into the seductive distractions of a refined and luxurious society would have preserved coningsby from the puerile profligacy of a college life or from being that idol of private tutors a young pedant it was that noble ambition the highest and best that must be born in the heart and organized in the brain which will not let a man be content unless his intellectual power is recognized by his race and desires that it should contribute to their welfare it is the heroic feeling the feeling that in old days produced demigods without which no state is safe without which political institutions are meat without salt the crown a bauble the church an establishment parliaments debating clubs and civilization itself but a fitful and transient dream end of chapter one chapter two less than a year after the arrival of coningsby at cambridge and which he had only once quitted in the interval and that to pass a short time in berkshire with his friend buckhurst occurred the death of king william the fourth this event necessarily induced a dissolution of the parliament elected under the auspices of sir robert peel in eighteen thirty four and after the publication of the tamworth manifesto the death of the king was a great blow to what had now come to be generally styled the conservative cause it was quite unexpected within a fortnight of his death eminent persons still believed that it was only the hay fever had his majesty lived until after the then impending registration the whigs would have been again dismissed nor is there any doubt that under these circumstances the conservative cause would have secured for the new ministers a parliamentary majority what would have been the consequences to the country if the four years of whig rule from eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty one had not occurred it is easier to decide what would have been the consequences to the whigs some of their great friends might have lacked blue ribbons and lord lieutenancies and some of their little friends comfortable places in the customs and excise they would have lost undoubtedly the distribution of four years patronage we can hardly say the exercise of four years power but they would have existed at this moment as the most powerful and popular opposition that ever flourished in this country if indeed the course of events had not long ere this carried them back to their old posts in a proud and intelligible position the reform bill did not do more injury to the tories than the attempt to govern the country without a decided parliamentary majority did the whigs 
The greatest of all evils is a weak government. They cannot carry good measures. They are forced to carry bad ones. The death of the king was a great blow to the conservative cause. That is to say, it darkened the brow of Tadpole, quailed the heart of Taper, crushed all the rising hopes of those numerous statesmen who believed that the country must be saved if they received twelve hundred a year. It is a peculiar class, that. Twelve hundred pounds per annum paid quarterly is their idea of political science and human nature. To receive twelve hundred pounds per annum is government. To try to receive twelve hundred pounds per annum is opposition. To wish to receive twelve hundred pounds per annum is ambition. If a man wants to get into Parliament and does not want to get twelve hundred pounds per annum, they look upon him as daft, as a benighted being. They stare in each other's faces and ask, what can blank want to get into Parliament for? They have no conception that public reputation is a motive power, and with many men the greatest. They have as much idea of fame or celebrity, even of the masculine impulse of an honourable pride, as eunuchs of manly joys. The twelve hundred a yearers were in despair about the king's death. Their loyal souls were sorely grieved that his gracious majesty had not outlived the registration. All their happy inventions about hay fever, circulated in confidence, and sent by post to chairman of conservative associations, followed by a royal funeral. General election about to take place with the old registration, government boroughs against them, and the young queen for a cry. What a cry! Youth, beauty, and a queen! Taper grew pale at the thought. What could they possibly get up to countervail it? Even church and corn laws together would not do. And then church was sulky, for the conservative cause had just made it a present of a commission, and all that the country gentlemen knew of conservatism was that it would not repeal the malt tax, and had made them repeal their pledges. Yet a cry must be found. A dissolution without a cry, in the taper philosophy, would be a world without a sun. A rise might be got by independence of the House of Lords, and Lord Lyndhurst's summaries might be well circulated at one penny per hundred, large discount allowed to conservative associations, and endless credit. Tadpole, however, was never very fond of the House of Lords. Besides, it was too limited. Tadpole wanted the young queen brought in the rogue. At length, one morning, Taper came up to him with a slip of paper and a smile of complacent austerity on his dull visage. I think, Mr. Tadpole, that will do. Tadpole took the paper and read, Our young queen and our old institutions. The eyes of Tadpole sparkled as if they had met a gnomic sentence of Periander or Thales. Then turning to Taper, he said, what do you think of ancient instead of old? You cannot have our modern queen and our ancient institutions, said Mr. Taper. The dissolution was soon followed by an election for the borough of Cambridge. The Conservative cause candidate was an old Etonian. There was a bond of sympathy which imparted zeal even to those who were a little sceptical of the essential virtues of conservatism. Every undergraduate, especially who remembered the distant spires, became enthusiastic. Buckhurst took a very decided part. He cheered, he canvassed, he brought men to the poll whom none could move, he influenced his friends and his companions. Even Coningsby caught the contagion, and Vere, who had imbibed much of Coningsby's political sentiment, prevailed on himself to be neutral. The conservative cause triumphed, in the person of its Eton champion. The day the member was chaired, several men in Coningsby's rooms were talking over their triumph. "'By Jove!' said the panting Buckhurst, throwing himself on the sofa. "'It was well done. Never was anything better done. An immense triumph. The greatest triumph the Conservative cause has had. And yet,' he added, laughing, "'if any fellow were to ask me what the Conservative cause is, I am sure I should not know what to say. Why, it is the cause of our glorious institution, said Coningsby. A crown robbed of its prerogatives, a church controlled by a commission, and an aristocracy that does not lead. 
under whose genial influence the order of the peasantry, a country's pride, has vanished from the face of the lands, said Henry Sidney, and is succeeded by a race of serfs who are called labourers and who burn ricks. Under which, continued Coningsby, the crown has become a cipher, the church a sect, the nobility drones, and the people drudges. It is the great constitutional cause, said Lord Vere, that refuses everything to opposition, yields everything to agitation, conservative in Parliament, destructive out of doors, that has no objection to any change, provided only it be effected by unauthorised means. The first public association of men, said Coningsby, who have worked for an avowed end without enunciating a single principle. And who have established political infidelity throughout the land, said Lord Henry. By Jove, said Buckhurst, what infernal fools we have made ourselves this last week. Nay, said Coningsby, smiling, it was our last schoolboy weakness. Floriat etona under all circumstances. I certainly, Coningsby, said Lord Vere, shall not assume the conservative cause instead of the cause for which Hampton died in the field and Sidney on the scaffold. The cause for which Hampton died in the field and Sidney on the scaffold, said Coningsby, was the cause of the Venetian Republic. How, how, cried Buckhurst. I repeat it, said Coningsby, the great object of the Whig leaders in England from the first movement under Hampton to the last most successful one in 1688, was to establish in England a high aristocratic republic on the model of the Venetian, then the study and admiration of all speculative politicians. Read Harrington, turn over Algin and Sidney, and you will see how the minds of the English leaders in the seventeenth century were saturated with the Venetian type. And they at length succeeded. William the Third found them out. He told the Whig leaders, I will not be a doge. He balanced parties. He baffled them as the Puritans baffled them fifty years before. The reign of Anne was a struggle between the Venetian and the English systems. Two great Whig nobles, Argyle and Somerset, worthy of seats in the Council of Ten, forced their sovereign on her deathbed to change the ministry. They accomplished their object. They brought in a new family on their own terms. George I was a doge. George II was a doge. They were what William III, a great man, would not be. George III tried not to be a doge, but it was impossible materially to resist the deeply laid combination. He might get rid of the Whig Magnificos, but he could not rid himself of the Venetian Constitution. And a Venetian Constitution did govern England from the accession of the House of Hanover until 1832. Now, I do not ask you, Vere, to relinquish the political tenets which in ordinary times would have been your inheritance. All I say is, the constitution introduced by your ancestors, having been subverted by their descendants, your contemporaries, beware of still holding Venetian principles of government when you have not a Venetian constitution to govern with. Do what I'm doing, what Henry Sidney and Buckhurst are doing, what other men that I could mention are doing. Hold yourself aloof from political parties, which, from the necessity of things, have ceased to have distinctive principles, and are therefore practically only factions, and wait and see whether with patience, energy, honour, and Christian faith, and a desire to look to the national welfare, and not to sectional and limited interests, whether, I say, we may not discover some great principles to guide us, to which we may adhere, and which then, if true, will ultimately guide and control others. The Whigs are worn out, said Vere. Conservatism is a sham, and radicalism is pollution. I, certainly, said Buckhurst, when I get into the House of Commons, shall speak my mind without reference to any party whatever and all I hope is we may all come in at the same time, and then we may make a party of our own. I have always heard my father say, said Vere, that there was nothing so difficult as to organise an independent party in the House of Commons. Ay, but that was in the Venetian period, Vere, said Henry Sidney, smiling. I dare say, said Buckhurst, 
the only way to make a party in the house of commons is just the one that succeeds anywhere else men must associate together when you are living in the same set dining together every day and quizzing the dons it is astonishing how well men agree as for me i would never enter into a conspiracy unless the conspirators were fellows who had been at eton with me and then there would be no treachery let us think of principles and not of parties said coningsby for my part said buckhurst whenever a political system is breaking up as in this country at present i think the very best thing is to brush all the old dons off the stage they never take to the new road kindly they are always hampered by their exploded prejudices and obsolete traditions i don't think a single man vere that sat in the venetian senate ought to be allowed to sit in the present english house of commons well no one does in our family except my uncle philip said lord henry and the moment i want it he will resign for he detests parliament it interferes so with his hunting well we all have fair parliamentary prospects said buckhurst that is something i wish we were in now heaven forbid said coningsby i tremble at the responsibility of a seat at any time with my present unsettled and perplexed views there is nothing from which i should recoil so much as the house of commons i quite agree with you said henry sydney the best thing we can do is to keep as clear of political party as we possibly can how many men waste the best part of their lives in painfully apologizing for conscientious deviation from a parliamentary course which they adopted when they were boys without thought or prompted by some local connection or interest to secure a seat it was the midnight following the morning when this conversation took place that coningsby alone and having just quitted a rather boisterous party of wassailers who had been celebrating at buckhurst's rooms the triumph of eton statesmen if not of conservative principles stopped in the precincts of that royal college that reminded him of his school days to cool his brow in the summer air that even at that hour was soft and to calm his mind in the contemplation of the still the sacred and the beauteous scene that surrounded him there rose that fane the pride and boast of cambridge not unworthy to rank among the chief temples of christendom its vast form was exaggerated in the uncertain hour part shrouded in the deepest darkness while a flood of silver light suffused its southern side distinguished with revealing beam the huge ribs of its buttresses and bathed with mild lustre its airy pinnacles where is the spirit that raised these walls thought coningsby is it indeed extinct is then this civilization so much vaunted inseparable from moderate feelings and little thoughts if so give me back barbarism but i cannot believe it man that is made in the image of the creator is made for godlike deeds come what come may i will cling to the heroic principle it can alone satisfy my soul end of chapter 2 end of section 19《20》of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Five, Chapter Three. We must now revert to the family, or rather the household, of Lord Monmouth, in which considerable changes and events had occurred since the visit of Coningsby to the castle in the preceding autumn. In the first place, the earliest frost of the winter had carried off the aged proprietor of Hellingsley, that contiguous estate which Lord Monmouth so much coveted, the possession of which was indeed one of the few objects of his life, and to secure which he was prepared to pay far beyond its intrinsic value, great as that undoubtedly was. Yet Lord Monmouth did not become its possessor. Long as his mind had been intent upon the subject, skilful as had been his combinations to secure his prey and unlimited the means which were to achieve his purpose another stepped in and without his privity without even the consolation of a struggle stole away the prize 
and this too a man whom he hated almost the only individual out of his own family that he did hate a man who had crossed him before in similar enterprises who was his avowed foe had lavished treasure to oppose him in elections raised associations against his interests established journals to assail him denounced him in public agitated against him in private had declared more than once that he would make the country too hot for him his personal inveterate indomitable foe mr millbank of millbank the loss of hellingsley was a bitter disappointment to lord monmouth but the loss of it to such an adversary touched him to the quick he did not seek to control his anger he could not succeed even in concealing his agitation he threw upon rigby that glance so rare with him but under which men always quailed that play of the eye which lord monmouth shared in common with henry the eighth that struck awe into the trembling commons when they had given an obnoxious vote as the king entered the gallery of his palace and looked around him it was a look which implied that dreadful question why have i bought you that such things should happen why have i unlimited means and unscrupulous agents it made rigby even feel even his brazen tones were hushed to fly from everything disagreeable was the practical philosophy of lord monmouth but he was as brave as he was sensual he would not shrink before the new proprietor of hellingsley he therefore remained at the castle with an aching heart and redoubled his hospitalities an ordinary mind might have been soothed by the unceasing consideration and the skilful and delicate flattery that ever surrounded lord monmouth but his sagacious intelligence was never for a moment the dupe of his vanity he had no self-love and as he valued no one there were really no feelings to play upon he saw through everybody and everything and when he had detected their purpose discovered their weakness or their vileness he calculated whether they could contribute to his pleasure or his convenience in a degree that counterbalanced the objections which might be urged against their intentions or their less pleasing and profitable qualities to be pleased was always a principal object with lord monmouth but when a man wants vengeance gay amusement is not exactly a satisfactory substitute a month elapsed lord monmouth with a serene or smiling visage to his guests but in private taciturn and morose scarcely ever gave a word to mr rigby but continually bestowed on him glances which painfully affected the appetite of that gentleman in a hundred ways it was intimated to mr rigby that he was not a welcome guest and yet something was continually given to him to do which rendered it impossible for him to take his departure in this state of affairs another event occurred which changed the current of feeling and by its possible consequences distracted the marquis from his brooding meditations over his discomfiture in the matter of hellingsley the prince colonna who since the steeplechase had imbibed a morbid predilection for such amusements and indeed for every species of rough riding was thrown from his horse and killed on the spot this calamity broke up the party at coningsby which was not at the moment very numerous mr rigby by command instantly seized the opportunity of preventing the arrival of other guests who were expected this catastrophe was the cause of mr rigby resuming in a great measure his old position in the castle there were a great many things to be done and all disagreeable he achieved them all and studied everybody's convenience coroner's inquests funerals especially weeping women these were all spectacles which lord monmouth could not endure but he was so high-bred that he would not for the world that there should be in manner or degree the slightest deficiency in propriety or even sympathy mr rigby did it all gave evidence at the inquest was chief mourner at the funeral and arranged everything so well that not a single emblem of death crossed the sight of lord monmouth while madame colonna found submission in his exhortations and the princess lucretia a little more pale and pensive than usual listened with tranquillity to his discourse on the vanity of all sublunary things 
when the tumult had subsided and habits and feelings had fallen into their old routine and relapsed into their ancient channels the marquis proposed that they should all return to london and with great formality though with warmth begged that madame colonna would ever consider his roof as her own all were glad to quit the castle which now presented a scene so different from its former animation and madame colonna weeping accepted the hospitality of her friend until the impending expansion of the spring would permit her to return to italy this notice of her return to her own country seemed to occasion the marquis great disquietude after they had remained about a month in london madame colonna sent for mr rigby one morning to tell him how very painful it was to her feelings to remain under the roof of monmouth house without the sanction of a husband that the circumstance of being a foreigner under such unusual affliction might have excused though not authorized the step at first and for a moment but that the continuance of such a course was quite out of the question that she owed it to herself to her stepchild no longer to trespass on this friendly hospitality which if persisted in might be liable to misconstruction mr rigby listened with great attention to this statement and never in the least interrupted madame colonna and then offered to do that which he was convinced the lady desired namely to make the marquis acquainted with the painful state of her feelings this he did according to his fashion and with sufficient dexterity mr rigby himself was anxious to know which way the wind blew and the mission with which he had been entrusted fell in precisely with his inclinations and necessities the marquis listened to the communication and sighed then turned gently round and surveyed himself in the mirror and sighed again then said to rigby you understand exactly what i mean rigby it is quite ridiculous their going and infinitely distressing to me they must stay rigby repaired to the princess full of mysterious bustle and with a face beaming with importance and satisfaction he made much of the two sighs fully justified the confidence of the marquis in his comprehension of unexplained intentions prevailed on madame colonna to have some regard for the feelings of one so devoted expatiated on the insignificance of worldly misconstructions when replied to by such honourable intentions and fully succeeded in his mission they did stay month after month rolled on and still they stayed every month all the family becoming more resigned or more content and more cheerful as for the marquis himself mr rigby never remembered him more serene and even joyous his lordship scarcely ever entered general society the colonna family remained in strict seclusion and he preferred the company of these accomplished and congenial friends to the mob of the great world between madame colonna and mr rigby there had always subsisted considerable confidence now that gentleman seemed to have achieved fresh and greater claims to her regard in the pleasure with which he looked forward to her approaching alliance with his patron he reminded her of the readiness with which he had embraced her suggestions for the marriage of her daughter with coningsby always obliging she was never wearied of chanting his praises to her noble admirer who was apparently much gratified she should have bestowed her esteem on one whom she would necessarily in after life see so much it is seldom the lot of husbands that their confidential friends gain the regards of their brides i am glad you all like rigby said lord monmouth as you will see so much of him the remembrance of the hellingsley failure seemed to be erased from the memory of the marquis rigby never recollected him more cordial and confidential and more equable in his manner he told rigby one day that he wished that monmouth house should possess the most sumptuous and the most fanciful boudoir in london or paris what a hint for rigby that gentleman consulted the first artists and gave them some hints in return his researches on domestic decoration ranged through all ages he even meditated a rapid tour to mature his inventions but his confidence in his native taste and genius ultimately convinced him that this movement was unnecessary the summer advanced the death of the king occurred 
the dissolution summoned Rigby to Coningsby and the borough of Darlford. His success was marked certain in the secret books of Tadpole and Taper. A manufacturing town, enfranchised under the Reform Act, already gained by the Conservative cause. Here was reaction, here influence of property, influence of character, too, for no one was so popular as Lord Monmouth, a most distinguished nobleman of strict conservative principles, who, if he carried the county and the manufacturing borough also, merited the strawberry leaf. "'There will be no holding Rigby,' said Taper. "'I'm afraid he will be looking for something very high.' "'The higher the better,' rejoined Tadpole, "'and then he will not interfere with us. "'I like your high flyers. "'It is your plodders I detest, "'wearing old hats and high lows, "'speaking in committee, "'and thinking they are men of business, damn them.' Rigby went down and made some impressive speeches. At least they read very well in some of his second-rate journals, where all the uproar figured as loud cheering, and the interruption of a cabbage stalk was represented as a question from some intelligent individual in the crowd. The fact is, Rigby bored his audience too much with history, especially with the French Revolution, which he fancied was his forte, so that people at last, whenever he made any allusion to the subject, were almost as terrified as if they had seen the guillotine. Rigby had as yet one great advantage. He had no opponent, and without personal opposition no contest can be very bitter. It was for some days Rigby versus liberal principles, and Rigby had much the best of it, for he abused liberal principles roundly in his harangues, who, not being represented on the occasion, made no reply while plenty of ale and some capital songs by Lucian Gay, who went down express, gave the right cue to the mob, who declared in chorus beneath the windows of Rigby's hotel that he was a fine old English gentleman. But there was to be a contest, no question about that, and a sharp one, although Rigby was to win and well. The Liberal Party had been so fastidious about their new candidate that they had none ready, though several biting. Jawster Sharp thought at one time that sheer necessity would give him another chance still. But even Rigby was preferable to Jawster Sharp, who, finding it would not do, published his long-prepared valedictory address, in which he told his constituents that, having long sacrificed his health to their interests, he was now obliged to retire into the bosom of his family, and a very well-provided-for family, too. All this time the Liberal deputation from Darlford, two aldermen, three town councillors, and the secretary of the Reform Association, were walking about London like mad things, eating luncheons and looking for a candidate. They called at the Reform Club twenty times in the morning, badgered whips and red tapers, were introduced to candidates, badgered candidates, examined would-be members as if they were at a cattle show, listened to political pedigrees, dictated political pledges, referred to Hansard to see how men had voted, inquired whether men had spoken, finally discussed terms. But they never could hit the right man. If the principles were right, there was no money, and if money was ready, money would not take pledges. In fact, they wanted a phoenix, a very rich man, who would do exactly as they liked, with extremely low opinions and with very high connections. If he would go for the ballot and had a handle to his name, it would have the best effect, said the secretary of the Reform Association, because, you see, we are fighting against a right honourable, and you have no idea how much that takes with the mob. The deputation had been three days in town, and urged by dispatches by every train to bring affairs to a conclusion. Jaded, perplexed, confused, they were ready to fall into the hands of the first jobber or bold adventurer. They discussed over their dinner at a Strand coffee-house the claims of the various candidates who had presented themselves. Mr. Donald Macpherson Macfarlane, who would only pay the legal expenses, he was soon dispatched. Mr. Gingerly Brown of German Street, the younger son of a baronet, who would go as far as a thousand pounds, providing the seat was secured. Mr. Juggins, a distiller, two thousand pound man, but who would not agree to any annual subscriptions. 
Sir Baptist placid, vague about expenditure, but repeatedly declaring that there could be no difficulty on that head. He, however, had a moral objection to subscribing to the races, and that was a great point at Darlford. Sir Baptist would subscribe a guinea per annum to the infirmary, and the same to all religious societies without any distinction of sects. But races, it was not the sum, a hundred pounds per annum, but the principle. He had a moral objection. In short, the deputation began to suspect what was the truth, that they were a day after the fair, and that all the electioneering rips that swarm in the purlieus of political clubs during an impending dissolution of Parliament, men who become political characters in their small circle because they have been talked of as once having had an intention to stand for places for which they never offered themselves, or for having stood for places where they never could by any circumstance have succeeded, were in fact nibbling at their dainty morsel. At this moment of despair a ray of hope was imparted to them by a confidential note from a secretary of the Treasury who wished to see them at the Reform Club on the morrow. You may be sure they were punctual to their appointment. The secretary received them with great consideration. He had got them a candidate and one of high mark, the son of a peer, and connected with the highest Whig houses. Their eyes sparkled. A real honourable. If they liked, he would introduce them immediately to the Honourable Alberic de Cressy. He had only to introduce them, as there was no difficulty either as to means or opinions, expenses or pledges. The secretary returned with a young gentleman, whose diminutive stature would seem, from his smooth and singularly puerile countenance, to be merely the consequence of his very tender years. But Mr. de Cressy was really of age, or at least would be by nomination day. He did not say a word, but looked like the rosebud which dangled in the buttonhole of his frock coat. The aldermen and town councillors were what is sometimes emphatically styled flabbergasted. They were speechless from bewilderment. Mr. de Cressy will go for the ballot, said the Secretary of the Treasury, with an audacious eye and a demure look, and for total and immediate, if you press him hard, but don't, if you can help it, because he has an uncle, an old county member, who has prejudices and might disinherit him. However, we answer for him, and I am very happy that I have been the means of bringing about an arrangement which I feel will be mutually advantageous. And so saying, the secretary effected his escape. Circumstances, however, retarded for a season the political career of the Honourable Alberic de Crecy. While the Liberal Party at Darlford were suffering under the daily inflictions of Mr. Rigby's slashing style, and the Post brought them very unsatisfactory prospects of a champion, one offered himself, and in an address which intimated that he was no man of straw, likely to proceed from any contest in which he chose to embark the town was suddenly placarded with a letter to the independent electors from Mr. Milbank, the new proprietor of Hellingsley. He expressed himself as one not anxious to obtrude himself on their attention, and founding no claim to their confidence on his recent acquisition, but at the same time as one resolved that the free and enlightened community, with which he must necessarily hereafter be much connected, should not become the nomination borough of any peer of the realm without a struggle if they chose to make one. And so he offered himself, if they could not find a better candidate, without waiting for the ceremony of a requisition. He was exactly the man they wanted, and though he had no handle to his name, and was somewhat impracticable about pledges, his fortune was so great and his character so high that it might be hoped that the people would be almost as content as if they were appealed to by some obscure scion of factitious nobility subscribing to political engagements which he could not comprehend and which in general are vomited with as much facility as they are swallowed end of chapter three chapter four the people of darlford who, as long as the contest for their representation remained between Mr. Rigby and the abstraction called liberal principles, appeared to be very indifferent about the result, 
the moment they learned that for the phrase had been substituted a substance and that too in the form of a gentleman who was soon to figure as their resident neighbour became excited speedily enthusiastic all the bells of all the churches rang when mr milbank commenced his canvass the conservatives on the alert if not alarmed insisted on their champion also showing himself in all directions and in the course of four-and-twenty hours such is the contagion of popular feeling the town was divided into two parties the vast majority of which were firmly convinced that the country could only be saved by the return of mr rigby or preserved from inevitable destruction by the election of mr milbank the results of the two canvases were such as had been anticipated from the previous reports of the respective agents and supporters in these days the personal canvas of a candidate is a mere form the whole country that is to be invaded has been surveyed and mapped out before entry every position reconnoitred the chain of communications complete in the present case as was not unusual both candidates were really supported by numerous and reputable adherents and both had good grounds for believing that they would be ultimately successful but there was a body of the electors sufficiently numerous to turn the election who would not promise their votes conscientious men who felt the responsibility of the duty that the constitution had entrusted to their discharge and who would not make up their minds without duly weighing the respective merits of the two rivals this class of deeply meditative individuals are distinguished not only by their pensive turn of mind but by a charitable vein that seems to pervade their being not only will they think of your request but for their parts they wish both sides equally well decision indeed as it must dash the hopes of one of their solicitors seems infinitely painful to them they have always a good reason for postponing it if you seek their suffrage during the canvass they reply that the writ not having come down the day of election is not yet fixed if you call again to inform them that the writ has arrived they rejoin that perhaps after all there may not be a contest if you call a third time half dead with fatigue to give them friendly notice that both you and your rival have pledged yourselves to go to the poll they twitch their trousers rub their hands and with a dull grin observe well we shall see come mr jobson says one of the committee with an insinuating smile give mr milbank one jobson i think you and i know each other says a most influential supporter with a knowing nod yes mr smith i should think we did come come give us one well i have not made up my mind yet gentlemen jobson says a solemn voice didn't you tell me the other night you wished well to this gentleman so i do i wish well to everybody replies the imperturbable jobson well jobson exclaims another member of the committee with a sigh who could have supposed that you would have been an enemy i don't wish to be no enemy to no man mr tripp come jobson says a jolly tanner if i wanted to be a parliament man i don't think you could refuse me one i don't think i could mr oakfield well then give it to my friend well sir i'll think about it leave him to me says another member of the committee with a significant look i know how to get round him it's all right yes leave him to hayfield mr milbank he knows how to manage him but all the same jobson continues to look as little tractable and lamb-like as can well be fancied and here in a work which in an unpretending shape aspires to take neither an uninformed nor a partial view of the political history of the ten eventful years of the reform struggle we should pause for a moment to observe the strangeness that only five years after the reconstruction of the electoral body by the whig party in a borough called into political existence by their policy a manufacturing town too the candidate comprising in his person every quality and circumstance which could recommend him to the constituency and his opponent the worst specimen of the old generation a political adventurer who owed the least disreputable part of his notoriety to his opposition to the reform bill 
that in such a borough under such circumstances there should be a contest and that too one of a very doubtful issue what was the cause of this are we to seek it in the reaction of the tadpoles and the tapers that would not be a satisfactory solution reaction to a certain extent is the law of human existence in the particular state of affairs before us england after the reform act it could never be doubtful that time would gradually and in some instances rapidly counteract the national impulse of eighteen thirty two there never could have been a question for example that the english counties would have reverted to their natural allegiance to their proprietors but the results of the appeals to the third estate in eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty seven are not to be accounted for by a mere adjustment of legitimate influences the truth is that considerable as are the abilities of the whig leaders highly accomplished as many of them unquestionably must be acknowledged in parliamentary debate experienced in council sedulous in office eminent as scholars powerful from their position the absence of individual influence and of the pervading authority of a commanding mind have been the cause of the fall of the whig party such a supremacy was generally acknowledged in lord grey on the accession of his party to power but it was the supremacy of a tradition rather than of a fact almost at the outset of his authority his successor was indicated when the crisis arrived the intended successor was not in the whig ranks it is in this virtual absence of a real and recognized leader almost from the moment that they passed their great measure that we must seek a chief cause of all that insubordination all those distempered ambitions and all those dark intrigues that finally broke up not only the whig government but the whig party demoralized their ranks and sent them to the country both in eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty seven with every illusion which had operated so happily in their favour in eighteen thirty two scattered to the winds in all things we trace the irresistible influence of the individual and yet the interval that elapsed between eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty seven proved that there was all this time in the whig array one entirely competent to the office of leading a great party though his capacity for that fulfilment was too tardily recognized lord john russell has that degree of imagination which though evinced rather in sentiment than expression still enables him to generalize from the details of his reading and experience and to take those comprehensive views which however easily depreciated by ordinary men in an age of routine are indispensable to a statesman in the conjunctures in which we live he understands therefore his position and he has the moral intrepidity which prompts him ever to dare that which his intellect assures him is politic he is consequently at the same time sagacious and bold in counsel as an administrator he is prompt and indefatigable he is not a natural orator and labours under physical deficiencies which even a demosthenic impulse could scarcely overcome but he is experienced in debate quick in reply fertile in resource takes large views and frequently compensates for a dry and hesitating manner by the expression of those noble truths that flash across the fancy and rise spontaneously to the lip of men of poetic temperament when addressing popular assemblies if we add to this a private life of dignified repute the accidents of his birth and rank which never can be severed from the man the scion of a great historic family and born as it were to the hereditary service of the state it is difficult to ascertain at what period or under what circumstances the whig party have ever possessed or could obtain a more efficient leader but we must return to the darlford election the class of thoughtful voters was sufficiently numerous in that borough to render the result of the contest doubtful to the last and on the eve of the day of nomination both parties were equally sanguine nomination day altogether is an unsatisfactory affair there is little to be done and that little mere form the tedious hours remain and no one can settle his mind to anything 
It is not a holiday, for every one is serious. It is not business, for no one can attend to it. It is not a contest, for there is no canvassing, nor an election, for there is no poll. It is the day of lounging without an object, and luncheons without an appetite, of hopes and fears, confidence and dejection, bravado bets and secret hedging, and, about midnight, of furious suppers of grilled bones, brandy and water, and recklessness. The President and Vice-President of the Conservative Association, the Secretary and the four solicitors who were agents, had impressed upon Mr. Rigby that it was of the utmost importance and must produce a great moral effect if he obtained the show of hands. With his powers of eloquence and their secret organization, they flattered themselves it might be done. With this view, Rigby inflicted a speech of more than two hours' duration on the electors, who bore it very kindly, as the mob likes, above all things, that the ceremonies of nomination day should not be cut short. Moreover, there is nothing that the mob likes so much as a speech. Rigby, therefore, had on the whole a far from unfavourable audience, and he availed himself of their forbearance. He brought in his crack theme, the guillotine, and dilated so elaborately upon its qualities that one of the gentlemen below could not refrain from exclaiming, I wish you may get it. This exclamation gave Mr. Rigby what is called a great opening, which, like a practised speaker, he immediately seized. He denounced the sentiment as un-English, and got much cheered. Excited by this success, Rigby began to call everything else un-English, with which he did not agree, until menacing murmurs began to rise, when he shifted the subject and rose into a grand peroration, in which he assured them that the eyes of the whole empire were on this particular election, cries of, that's true, from all sides, and that England expected every man to do his duty. "'And who do you expect to do yours?' inquired a gentleman below, about that air pension. "'Rigby,' screeched a hoarse voice, "'don't you mind, you govet them well.' "'Rigby, keep your spirits up, old chap, we will have you.' "'Now,' said a stentorian voice, and a man as tall as Saul looked round him. This was the engaged leader of the conservative mob. The eye of every one of his minions was instantly on him. Now, our young queen and our old institutions, Rigby for ever. This was a signal for the instant appearance of the leader of the liberal mob. Magog Wrath, not so tall as Bully Bluck, his rival, had a voice almost as powerful, a back much broader, and a countenance far more forbidding. Now, my boys, the queen and Milbank for ever. These rival cries were the signals for a fight, between the two bands of gladiators in the face of the hustings, the body of the people little interfering. Bully Bluck seized Magog Wrath's colours, they wrestled, they seized each other, their supporters were engaged in mutual contest, it appeared to be a most alarming and perilous fray. Several ladies from the windows screamed, one fainted, a band of special constables pushed their way through the mob, you heard their staves resounded on the skulls of all who opposed them, especially the little boys. Order was at length restored, and to tell the truth, the only hurts inflicted were those which came from the special constables. Bully Bluck and Magog Wrath, with all their fierce looks, flaunting colours, loud cheers, and desperate assaults, were, after all, only a couple of condottieri, who were cautious never to wound each other. They were, in fact, a peaceful police, who kept the town in awe, and prevented others from being mischievous, who were more inclined to do harm. Their hired gangs were the safety valves for all the scamps of the borough, who, receiving a few shillings per head for their nominal service, and as much drink as they liked after the contest, were bribed and organized into peace and sobriety on the days in which their excesses were most to be apprehended. Now Mr. Milbank came forward. He was brief compared to Mr. Rigby, but clear and terse. No one could misunderstand him. He did not favour his hearers with any history, but gave them his views about taxes, free trade, placemen, and pensioners, whoever and wherever they might be. Hello, Rigby, about that ere pension? Milbank for ever, we will have him. Never mind, Rigby, you'll come in next time. 
Mr. Milbank was energetic about resident representatives, but did not understand that a resident representative meant the nominee of a great lord who lived in a great castle. Great cheering. There was a lord once who declared that if he liked, he would return his negro valet to Parliament. But Mr. Milbank thought those days were over. It remained for the people of Darlford to determine whether he was mistaken. Never, exclaimed the mob, Milbank for ever, Rigby in the river, no niggers, no wallets. Three groans for Rigby. His language ain't as purty as the Lunnon chap, said a critic below, but he speaks from his art, and give me the man who has got an art. That's your time of day, Mr. Robinson. Now, said Magog Rath, looking round, now the Queen and Milbank for ever, hurrah! The show of hands was entirely in favour of Mr. Milbank. Scarcely a hand was held up for Mr. Rigby below, except by Bully Bluck and his Praetorians. The chairman and the deputy chairman of the Conservative Association, the secretary and the four agents, severally and respectively, went up to Mr. Rigby and congratulated him on the result, as it was a known fact that the show of hands never won. The eve of polling day was now at hand. This was the most critical period of an election. All night, parties in disguise were perambulating the different wards, watching each other's tactics, masks, wigs, false noses, gentles in livery coats, men in female attire, a silent carnival of manoeuvre, vigilance, anxiety, and trepidation. The thoughtful voters about this time make up their minds. The enthusiasts who have told you twenty times a day for the last fortnight that they would get up in the middle of the night to serve you require the most watchful cooping. All the individuals who have assured you that their word is their bond change sides. Two of the Rigbyites met in the marketplace about an hour after midnight. Well, how goes it? said one. I have been the rounds, the blunts going like the ward pump. I saw a man come out of Moffat's house muffled up with a mask. I dodged him. It was Biggs. You don't mean that, do you? Dammy, I'll answer for Moffat. I never thought he was a true man. Told Robbins? I could not see him, but I met young Gunning and told him. Young Gunning, that won't do. I thought he was as right as the town clock. So did I, once. Hush, who comes here? The enemy, Franklin and Sampson Potts, keep close. I'll speak to them. Good night, Potts. Up rather late tonight? All fair election time. You ain't snoring, are you? Well, I hope the best man will win. I am sure he will. You must go for Moffat early to breakfast at the White Lion. That's your sort. Don't leave him. Unpole him yourself. I'm going off to Solomon Lacey's. He has got four Milbankites cooped up very drunk, and I want to get them quietly into the country before daybreak. Tis polling day. The candidates are roused from their slumbers at an early hour by the music of their own bands perambulating the town, and each playing the conquering hero to sustain the courage of their jaded employers by depriving them of that rest which can alone tranquillize the nervous system. There is something in that matin burst of music, followed by a shrill cheer from the boys of the borough, the only inhabitants yet up, that is very depressing. The committee rooms of each candidate are soon rife with black reports. Each side has received fearful bulletins of the preceding night campaign, and its consequences as exemplified in the morning, unprecedented turgivizations, mysterious absences, men who breakfast with one side and vote with the other, men who won't come to breakfast, men who won't leave breakfast. At ten o'clock Mr. Rigby was in a majority of twenty-eight. The polling was brisk and equal until the middle of the day, when it became slack. Mr. Rigby kept the majority, but an inconsiderable one. Mr. Milbank's friends were not disheartened, as it was known that the leading members of Mr. Rigby's committee had polled, whereas his opponents were principally reserved. At a quarter past two there was a great cheering and uproar. The four voters in favour of Milbank, whom Solomon Lacey had cooped up, made drunk, and carried into the country, had recovered their senses, made their escape, and voted as they originally intended. 
Soon after this Mr. Milbank was declared by his committee to be in a majority of one, but the committee of Mr. Rigby instantly posted a placard in large letters to announce that, on the contrary, their man was in a majority of nine. "'If we could only have got another registration,' whispered the principal agent to Mr. Rigby at a quarter past four. "'You think it's all over, then?' "'Why, I do not see now how we can win. We have polled all our dead men, and Millbank is seven ahead.' "'I have no doubt we shall be able to have a good petition,' said the consoling chairman of the Conservative Association. End of chapter 4 End of section 20《which would be adduced as evidence of Mr. Rigby's good management or good fortune. Hitherto that gentleman had persuaded the world that he was not only very clever, but that he was also always in luck, a quality which many appreciate more even than capacity. His reputation was unquestionably damaged both with his patron and his party. But what the tapers and the tadpoles thought or said, what even might be the injurious effect on his own career of the loss of this election assumed an insignificant character when compared with its influence on the temper and disposition of the marquis of monmouth and yet his carriage is now entering the courtyard of monmouth house and in all probability a few minutes would introduce him to that presence before which he had ere this trembled the marquis was at home and anxious to see mr rigby in a few minutes that gentleman was ascending the private staircase, entering the antechamber, and waiting to be received in the little saloon exactly as our Coningsby did more than five years ago, scarcely less agitated, but by feelings of a very different character. "'Well, you made a good fight of it,' exclaimed the Marquis in a cheerful and cordial tone, as Mr. Rigby entered his dressing-room. "'Patience, we shall win next time.' This reception instantly reassured the defeated candidate, though its contrast to that which he expected rather perplexed him. He entered into the details of the election, talked rapidly of the next registration, the propriety of petitioning, accustomed himself to hearing his voice with its habitual volubility in a chamber where he had feared it might not sound for some time. "'Damn politics!' said the Marquis. "'These fellows are in it for this Parliament.' and I am really weary of the whole affair. I begin to think the Duke was right, and it would have been best to have left them to themselves. I am glad you have come up at once, for I want you. The fact is, I am going to be married." This was not a startling announcement to Mr. Rigby. He was prepared for it, though scarcely could have hoped that he would have been favoured with it on the present occasion, instead of a morose comment on his misfortunes. Marriage, then, was the predominant idea of Lord Monmouth at the present moment, in whose absorbing interest all vexations were forgotten. Fortunate Rigby! Disgusted by the failure of his political combinations, his disappointments in not dictating to the country and not carrying the borough, and the slight prospect at present of obtaining the great object of his ambition, Lord Monmouth had resolved to precipitate his fate was about to marry immediately and quit England. "'You will be wanted, Rigby,' continued the Marquis. "'We must have a couple of trustees, and I have thought of you as one. You know you are my executor, and it is better not to bring in unnecessarily new names into the management of my affairs. Lord Eskdale will act with you.' Rigby, then, after all, was a lucky man. 
After such a succession of failures, he had returned only to receive fresh and the most delicate marks of his patron's good feeling and consideration. Lord Monmouth's trustee and executor. You know you are my executor. Sublime truth. It ought to be blazoned in letters of gold in the most conspicuous part of Rigby's library to remind him perpetually of his great and impending destiny. Lord Monmouth's executor, and very probably one of his residuary legatees. A legatee of some sort, he knew he was. What a splendid memento mori! What cared Rigby for the borough of Darlford? And as for his political friends, he wished them joy of their barren benches. Nothing was lost by not being in this Parliament. It was then with sincerity that Rigby offered his congratulations to his patron, he praised the judicious alliance, accompanied by every circumstance conducive to worldly happiness, distinguished beauty, perfect temper, princely rank. Rigby, who had hardly got out of his hustings vein, was most eloquent in his praises of Madame Colonna. "'An amiable woman,' said Lord Monmouth, "'and very handsome. I always admired her, and an agreeable person, too. I dare say a very good temper.' but I am not going to marry her. Might I then ask who it... Her stepdaughter, the Princess Lucretia, replied the Marquis quietly, looking at his ring. Here was a thunderbolt. Rigby had made another mistake. He had been working all this time for the wrong woman. The consciousness of being a trustee alone sustained him. There was an inevitable pause. The Marquis would not speak, however, and Rigby must. He babbled rather incoherently about the Princess Lucretia being admired by everybody, also that she was the most fortunate of women, as well as the most accomplished. He was just beginning to say he had known her from a child, when discretion stopped his tongue, which had a habit of running on somewhat rashly. But Rigby, though he often blundered in his talk, had the talent of extricating himself from the consequence of his mistakes. "'And madame must be highly gratified by all this,' observed Mr. Rigby, with an inquiring accent. He was dying to learn how she had first received the intelligence, and congratulated himself that his absence at his contest had preserved him from the storm. "'Madame Colonna knows nothing of our intentions,' said Lord Monmouth. "'And by the by, that is the very business on which I wish to see you, Rigby. I wish you to communicate them to her.' We are to be married, and immediately. It would gratify me that the wife of Lucretia's father should attend our wedding. You understand exactly what I mean, Rigby. I must have no scenes. Always happy to see the Princess Colonna under my roof. But then I like to live quietly, particularly at present. Harassed as I have been by the loss of these elections, by all this bad mismanagement, and by all these disappointments on subjects in which I was led to believe success was certain. Madame Colonna is at home, and the Marquis bowed Mr. Rigby out of the room. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The departure of Sidonia from Coningsby Castle in the autumn determined the Princess Lucretia on a step which had for some time before his arrival occupied her brooding imagination. Nature had bestowed on this lady an ambitious soul and a subtle spirit. She could dare much and could execute finely. Above all things she coveted power, and though not free from the characteristic susceptibility of her sex, the qualities that could engage her passions or fascinate her fancy must partake of that intellectual eminence which distinguished her. Though the Princess Lucretia in a short space of time had seen much of the world, she had as yet encountered no hero. In the admirers whom her rank, and sometimes her intelligence, assembled around her, her master had not yet appeared. Her heart had not trembled before any of those brilliant forms whom she was told her sex admired, nor did she envy any one the homage which she did not appreciate. There was, therefore, no disturbing element in the worldly calculations which she applied to that question which is, to woman, what a career is to man, the question of marriage. She would marry to gain power, and therefore she wished to marry the powerful. Lord Eskdale hovered around her, and she liked him. 
she admired his incomparable shrewdness his freedom from ordinary prejudices his selfishness which was always good-natured and the imperturbability that was not callous but lord eskdale had hovered round many it was his easy habit he liked clever women young but who had seen something of the world the princess lucretia pleased him much with the form and mind of a woman even in the nursery he had watched her development with interest and had witnessed her launch in that world where she floated at once with as much dignity and consciousness of superior power as if she had braved for seasons its waves and its tempests musing over lord eskdale the mind of lucretia was drawn to the image of his friend her friend the friend of her parents and why not marry lord monmouth the idea pleased her there was something great in the conception difficult and strange the result if achieved would give her all that she desired she devoted her mind to this secret thought she had no confidence she concentrated her intellect on one point and that was to fascinate the grandfather of coningsby while her stepmother was plotting that she should marry his grandson the volition of lucretia colonna was if not supreme of a power most difficult to resist there was something charm-like and alluring in the conversation of one who was silent to all others something in the tones of her low rich voice which acted singularly on the nervous system it was the voice of the serpent indeed there was an undulating movement in lucretia when she approached you which irresistibly reminded you of that mysterious animal lord monmouth was not insensible to the spell though totally unconscious of its purpose he found the society of lucretia very agreeable to him she was animated intelligent original her inquiries were stimulating her comments on what she saw and heard and read racy and often indicating a fine humour but all this was reserved for his ear before her parents as before all others lucretia was silent a little scornful never communicating never giving nor seeking amusement shut up in herself lord monmouth fell therefore into the habit of riding and driving with lucretia alone it was an arrangement which he found made his life more pleasant nor was it displeasing to madame colonna she looked upon lord monmouth's fancy for lucretia as a fresh tie for them all even the prince when his wife called his attention to the circumstance observed it with satisfaction it was a circumstance which represented in his mind a continuance of good eating and good drinking fine horses luxurious baths unceasing billiards in this state of affairs appeared sidonia known before to her stepmother but seen by lucretia for the first time truly he came saw and conquered those eyes that rarely met another's were fixed upon his searching yet unimpassioned glance she listened to that voice full of music yet void of tenderness and the spirit of lucretia colonna bowed before an intelligence that commanded sympathy yet offered none lucretia naturally possessed great qualities as well as great talents under a genial influence her education might have formed a being capable of imparting and receiving happiness but she found herself without a guide her father offered her no love her stepmother gained from her no respect her literary education was the result of her own strong mind and inquisitive spirit she valued knowledge and she therefore acquired it but not a single moral principle or a single religious truth had ever been instilled into her being frequent absence from her own country had by degrees broken off even an habitual observance of the forms of her creed while a life of undisturbed indulgence void of all anxiety and care while it preserved her from many of the temptations to vice deprived her of that wisdom more precious than rubies which adversity and affliction the struggles and the sorrows of existence can alone impart lucretia had passed her life in a refined but rather dissolute society not indeed that a word could call forth a maiden blush conduct that could pain the purest feelings could be heard or witnessed in those polished and luxurious circles 
the most exquisite taste pervaded their atmosphere and the uninitiated who found themselves in those perfumed chambers and those golden saloons might believe from all that passed before them that their inhabitants were as pure as orderly and as irreproachable as their furniture but among the habitual dwellers in these delicate halls there was a tacit understanding a prevalent doctrine that required no formal exposition no proofs and illustrations no comment and no gloss which was indeed rather a traditional conviction than an imparted dogma that the exoteric public were on many subjects the victims of very vulgar prejudices which these enlightened personages wished neither to disturb nor to adopt a being of such a temper bred in such a manner a woman full of intellect and ambition daring and lawless and satiated with prosperity is not made for equable fortunes and a uniform existence she would have sacrificed the world for sidonia for he had touched the fervent imagination that none before could approach but that inscrutable man would not read the secret of her heart and prompted alike by pique the love of power and a weariness of her present life lucretia resolved on that great result which mr rigby is now about to communicate to the princess colonna about half an hour after mr rigby had entered that lady's apartments it seemed that all the bells of monmouth house were ringing at the same time the sound even reached the marquis in his luxurious recess who immediately took a pinch of snuff and ordered his valet to lock the door of the antechamber the princess lucretia too heard the sounds she was lying on a sofa in her boudoir reading the inferno and immediately mustered her garrison in the form of a french maid and gave directions that no one should be admitted both the marquis and his intended bride felt that a crisis was at hand and resolved to participate in no scenes the ringing ceased there was again silence then there was another ring a short hasty and violent pull followed by some slamming of doors the servants who were all on the alert and had advantages of hearing and observation denied to their secluded master caught a glimpse of mr rigby endeavouring gently to draw back into her apartment madame colonna furious amid his deprecatory exclamations for heaven's sake my dear madame for your own sake now really i assure you you are quite wrong you are indeed it is a complete misapprehension i will explain everything i entreat i implore whatever you like just what you please only listen then the lady with a mantling visage and flashing eye violently closing the door was again lost to their sight a few minutes after there was a moderate ring and mr rigby coming out of the apartments with his cravat a little out of order as if he had had a violent shaking met the servant who would have entered order madame colonna's travelling carriage he exclaimed in a loud voice and send mademoiselle conrad here directly i don't think the fellow hears me added mr rigby and following the servant he added in a low tone and with a significant glance no travelling carriage no mademoiselle conrad order the britzka round as usual nearly another hour passed there was another ring very moderate indeed the servant was informed that madame colonna was coming down and she appeared as usual in a beautiful morning dress and leaning on the arm of mr rigby she descended the stairs and was handed into her carriage by that gentleman who seating himself by her side ordered them to drive to richmond lord monmouth having been informed that all was calm and that madame colonna attended by mr rigby had gone to richmond ordered his carriage and accompanied by lucretia and lucian gay departed immediately for blackwall where in whitebait a quiet bottle of claret the society of his agreeable friends and the contemplation of the passing steamers he found a mild distraction and an amusing repose mr rigby reported that evening to the marquis on his return that all was arranged and tranquil perhaps he exaggerated the difficulties to increase the service but according to his account they were considerable 
it required some time to make madame colonna comprehend the nature of his communication all rigby's diplomatic skill was expended in the gradual development when it was once fairly put before her the effect was appalling that was the first great ringing of bells rigby softened a little what he had personally endured but he confessed she sprang at him like a tigress balked of her prey and poured forth on him a volume of epithets many of which rigby really deserved but after all in the present instance he was not treacherous only base which he always was then she fell into a passion of tears and vowed frequently that she was not weeping for herself but only for that dear mr coningsby who had been treated so infamously and robbed of lucretia and whose heart she knew must break it seemed that rigby stemmed the first violence of her emotion by mysterious intimations of an important communication that he had to make and piquing her curiosity he calmed her passion but really having nothing to say he was nearly involved in fresh dangers he took refuge in the affectation of great agitation which prevented exposition the lady then insisted on her travelling carriage being ordered and packed as she was determined to set out for rome that afternoon this little occurrence gave rigby some few minutes to collect himself at the end of which he made the princess several announcements of intended arrangements all of which pleased her mightily though they were so inconsistent with each other that if she had not been a woman in a passion she must have detected that rigby was lying he assured her almost in the same breath that she was never to be separated from them and that she was to have any establishment in any country she liked he talked wildly of equipages diamonds shawls opera boxes and while her mind was bewildered with these dazzling objects he with intrepid gravity consulted her as to the exact amount she would like to have apportioned independent of her general revenue for the purposes of charity at the end of two hours exhausted by her rage and soothed by these visions madame colonna having grown calm and reasonable sighed and murmured a complaint that lord monmouth ought to have communicated this important intelligence in person upon this rigby instantly assured her that lord monmouth had been for some time waiting to do so but in consequence of her lengthened interview with rigby his lordship had departed for richmond with lucretia where he hoped that madame colonna and mr rigby would join him so it ended with a morning drive and suburban dinner rigby after what he had gone through finding no difficulty in accounting for the other guests not being present and bringing home madame colonna in the evening at times almost as gay and good-tempered as usual and almost oblivious of her disappointment when the marquis met madame colonna he embraced her with great courtliness and from that time consulted her on every arrangement he took a very early occasion of presenting her with a diamond necklace of great value the marquis was fond of making presents to persons to whom he thought he had not behaved very well and who yet spared him scenes the marriage speedily followed by special license at the villa of the right honourable nicholas rigby who gave away the bride the wedding was very select but brilliant as the diamond necklace a royal duke and duchess lady st julians and a few others mr ormsby presented the bride with a bouquet of precious stones and lord eskdale with a french fan in a diamond frame it was a fine day lord monmouth calm as if he were winning the st leger lucretia universally recognized as a beauty all the guests gay the princess colonna especially the travelling carriage is at the door which is to bear away the happy pair madame colonna embraces lucretia the marquis gives a grand bow they are gone the guests remain a while a prince of the blood will propose a toast there is another glass of champagne quaffed another ortolan devoured and then they rise and disperse madame colonna leaves with lady st julians whose guest for a while she is to become and in a few minutes their host is alone mr rigby retired into his library the repose of the chamber must have been grateful to his feelings after all this distraction 
It was spacious, well stored, classically adorned, and opened on a beautiful lawn. Rigby threw himself into an ample chair, crossed his legs, and resting his head on his arm, apparently fell into deep contemplation. He had some cause for reflection, and though he did once venture to affirm that Rigby never either thought or felt, this, perhaps, may be the exception that proves the rule. He could scarcely refrain from pondering over the strange event which he had witnessed, and at which he had assisted. It was an incident that might exercise considerable influence over his fortunes. His patron married, and married to one who certainly did not offer to Mr. Rigby such a prospect of easy management as her stepmother. Here were new influences arising, new characters, new situations, new contingencies. Was he thinking of all this? He suddenly jumps up, hurries to a shelf, and takes down a volume. It is his interleaved peerage, of which for twenty years he had been threatening an addition. Turning to the Marquisate of Monmouth, he took up his pen, and thus made the necessary entry. Married second time, August 3, 1837, the Princess Lucretia Colonna, daughter of Prince Paul Colonna, born at Rome, February 16th, 1819. That was what Mr. Rigby called a great fact. There was not a peerage compiler in England who had that date save himself. Before we close this slight narrative of the domestic incidents that occurred in the family of his grandfather since Coningsby quitted the castle, we must not forget to mention what happened to Wilbeck and Flora. Lord Monmouth took a great liking to the manager. He found him very clever in many things independently of his profession. He was useful to Lord Monmouth and did his work in an agreeable manner. And the future Lady Monmouth was accustomed to Flora and found her useful too, and did not like to lose her. And so the Marquis, turning all the circumstances in his mind, and being convinced that Villebecque could never succeed to any extent in England in his profession, and probably nowhere else, appointed him, to Villebecque's infinite satisfaction, intendant of his household with a considerable salary, while Flora still lived with her kind stepfather. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Another year elapsed, not so fruitful in incidents to Coningsby as the preceding ones, and yet not unprofitably passed. It had been spent in the almost unremitting cultivation of his intelligence. He had read deeply and extensively, digested his acquisitions, and had practised himself in surveying them, free from those conventional conclusions and those traditionary interferences that surrounded him. Although he had renounced his once cherished purpose of trying for university honours, an aim which he found discordant with the investigations on which his mind was bent, he had rarely quitted Cambridge. The society of his friends, the great convenience of public libraries, and the general tone of studious life around, rendered a university for him a genial residence. There is a moment in life when the pride and thirst of knowledge seem to absorb our being, and so it happened now to Coningsby, who felt each day stronger in his intellectual resources, and each day more anxious and avid to increase them. The habits of public discussion fostered by the debating society were also for Coningsby no inconsiderable tie to the university. This was the arena in which he felt himself at home. The promise of his Eton days was here fulfilled, and while his friends listened to his sustained argument or his impassioned declamation, the prompt reply or the apt retort, they looked forward with pride through the vista of years to the time when the hero of the youthful club should convince or dazzle in the Senate. It is probable, then, that he would have remained at Cambridge with slight intervals until he had taken his degree, had not circumstances occurred which gave altogether a new turn to his thoughts. When Lord Monmouth had fixed his wedding day, he had written himself to Coningsby to announce his intended marriage, and to request his grandson's presence at the ceremony. The letter was more than kind, it was warm and generous. 
he assured his grandson that this alliance should make no difference in the very ample provision which he had long intended for him that he should ever esteem coningsby his nearest relative and that while his death would bring to coningsby as considerable an independence as an english gentleman need desire so in his lifetime coningsby should ever be supported as became his birth breeding and future prospects lord monmouth had mentioned to lucretia that he was about to invite his grandson to their wedding and the lady had received the intimation with satisfaction it so happened that a few hours after lucretia who now entered the private rooms of lord monmouth without previously announcing her arrival met villebecque with a letter to coningsby in his hand lucretia took it away from him and said it should be posted with her own letters it never reached its destination our friend learned the marriage from the newspapers which somewhat astounded him but coningsby was fond of his grandfather and he wrote lord monmouth a letter of congratulation full of feeling and ingenuousness and which while it much pleased the person to whom it was addressed unintentionally convinced him that coningsby had never received his original communication lord monmouth spoke to villebecque who could throw sufficient light upon the subject but it was never mentioned to lady monmouth the marquis was a man who always found out everything and enjoyed the secret rather more than a year after the marriage when coningsby had completed his twenty-first year the year which he had passed so quietly at cambridge he received a letter from his grandfather informing him that after a variety of movements lady monmouth and himself were established in paris for the season and desiring that he would not fail to come over as soon as practicable and pay them as long a visit as the regulations of the university would permit so at the close of the december term coningsby quitted cambridge for paris passing through london he made his first visit to his banker at charing cross on whom he had periodically drawn since he commenced his college life he was in the outer counting-house making some inquiries about a letter of credit when one of the partners came out from an inner room and invited him to enter this firm had been for generations the bankers of the coningsby family and it appeared that there was a sealed box in their possession which had belonged to the father of coningsby and they wished to take this opportunity of delivering it to his son this communication deeply interested him and as he was alone in london at a hotel and on the wing for a foreign country he requested permission at once to examine it in order that he might again deposit it with them so he was shown into a private room for that purpose the seal was broken the box was full of papers chiefly correspondence among them was a packet described as letters from my dear helen the mother of coningsby in the interior of this packet there was a miniature of that mother he looked at it put it down looked at it again and again he could not be mistaken there was the same blue fillet and the bright hair it was an exact copy of that portrait which had so greatly excited his attention when at millbank this was a mysterious and singularly perplexing incident it greatly agitated him he was alone in the room when he made the discovery when he had recovered himself he sealed up the contents of the box with the exception of his mother's letters and the miniature which he took away with him and then re-delivered it to his banker for custody until his return coningsby found lord and lady monmouth in a splendid hotel in the faubourg st honore near the english embassy his grandfather looked at him with marked attention and received him with evident satisfaction indeed lord monmouth was greatly pleased that harry had come to paris it was the university of the world where everybody should graduate paris and london ought to be the great objects of all travellers the rest was mere landscape it cannot be denied that between lucretia and coningsby there existed from the first a certain antipathy and though circumstances for a short time had apparently removed or modified the aversion the manner of the lady when coningsby was ushered into her boudoir resplendent with all that parisian taste and luxury could devise 
was characterized by that frigid politeness which had preceded the days of their more genial acquaintance. If the manner of Lucretia were the same as before her marriage, a considerable change might, however, be observed in her appearance. Her fine form had become more developed, while her dress, that she once neglected, was elaborate and gorgeous, and of the last mode. Lucretia was the fashion of Paris, a great lady, greatly admired. A guest under such a roof, however, Coningsby was at once launched into the most brilliant circles of Parisian society, which he found fascinating. The art of society is, without doubt, perfectly comprehended and completely practised in the bright metropolis of France. An Englishman cannot enter a saloon without instantly feeling he is among a race more social than his compatriots. What, for example, is more consummate than the manner in which a French lady receives her guests? She unites graceful repose and unaffected dignity with the most amiable regard for others. She sees every one, she speaks to every one, she sees them at the right moment, she says the right thing. It is utterly impossible to detect any difference in the position of her guests by the spirit in which she welcomes them. There is indeed throughout every circle of Parisian society, from the chateau to the cabaret, a sincere homage to intellect, and this without any maudlin sentiment. None sooner than the Parisians can draw the line between factitious notoriety and honest fame, or sooner distinguish between the counterfeit celebrity and the standard reputation. In England we too often alternate between a supercilious neglect of genius and a rhapsodical pursuit of quacks. In England, when a new character appears in our circles, the first question always is, who is he? In France it is, what is he? In England, how much a year? In France, what has he done? End of chapter 7book five chapter eight of coningsby or the new generation by benjamin disraeli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight about a week after coningsby's arrival in paris as he was sauntering on the soft and sunny boulevards soft and sunny though christmas he met sidonia so you are here said sidonia turn now with me for i see you are only lounging and tell me when you came where you are and what you have done since we parted. I have been here myself but a few days. There was much to tell, and when Coningsby had rapidly related all that had passed, they talked of Paris. Sidonia had offered him hospitality until he learned that Lord Monmouth was in Paris, and that Coningsby was his guest. I am sorry you cannot come to me, he remarked. I would have shown you everybody and everything, but we shall meet often." I have already seen many remarkable things, said Coningsby, and met many celebrated persons. Nothing strikes me more in this brilliant city than the tone of its society, so much higher than our own. What an absence of petty personalities! How much conversation and how little gossip! Yet nowhere is there less pedantry. Here all women are as agreeable as is the remarkable privilege in London of some half-dozen." Men, too, and great men develop their minds. A great man in England, on the contrary, is generally the dullest dog in company. And yet how piteous to think that so fair a civilization should be in such imminent peril. Yes, that is a common opinion, and yet I am somewhat sceptical of its truth, replied Sidonia. I am inclined to believe that the social system of England is in infinitely greater danger than that of France we must not be misled by the agitated surface of this country. The foundations of its order are deep and sure. Learn to understand France. France is a kingdom with a republic for its capital. It has been always so for centuries. From the days of the League to the days of the Sections, to the days of 1830. It is still France, little changed, and only more national, for it is less frank and more Gallic, 
as England has become less Norman and more Saxon. And it is your opinion, then, that the present king may maintain himself? Every movement in this country, however apparently discordant, seems to tend to that inevitable end. He would not be on the throne if the nature of things had not demanded his presence. The kingdom of France required a monarch, the Republic of Paris required a dictator. He comprised in his person both qualifications, lineage and intellect, blood for the provinces, brains for the city. "'What a position! What an individual!' exclaimed Coningsby. "'Tell me,' he added eagerly, "'what is he, this prince of whom one hears in all countries at all hours, on whose existence we are told the tranquillity, almost the civilization of Europe depends, yet of whom we receive accounts so conflicting, so contradictory? Tell me, you who can tell me, tell me what he is.' Sidonia smiled at his earnestness. "'I have a creed of mine own,' he remarked, "'that the great characters of antiquity are at rare epochs reproduced for our wonder or our guidance. Nature, wearied with mediocrity, pours the warm metal into an heroic mould. When circumstances at length placed me in the presence of the King of France, I recognised Ulysses.' "'But is there no danger,' resumed Coningsby, after the pause of a few moments, "'that the Republic of Paris may absorb the Kingdom of France?' "'I suspect reverse,' replied Sidonia. "'The tendency of advanced civilization is in truth to pure monarchy. "'Monarchy is indeed a government which requires a high degree of civilization for its full development. "'It needs the support of free laws and manners, and of a widely diffused intelligence.' Political compromises are not to be tolerated except at periods of rude transition. An educated nation recoils from the imperfect vicariate of what is called a representative government. Your House of Commons, that has absorbed all other powers in the state, will, in all probability, fall more rapidly than it rose. Public opinion has a more direct, a more comprehensive, a more efficient organ for its utterance, than a body of men sectionally chosen. The printing press is a political element unknown to classic or feudal times. It absorbs in a great degree the duties of the sovereign, the priest, the parliament. It controls, it educates, it discusses. That public opinion, when it acts, would appear in the form of one who has no class interests. In an enlightened age, the monarch on the throne free from the vulgar prejudices and the corrupt interests of the subject, becomes again divine. At this moment they reached that part of the boulevards which leads into the place of the Madeleine, where the Sidonia was bound, and Coningsby was about to quit his companion when Sidonia said, "'I am only going a step over to the Rue Tranchée to say a few words to a friend of mine, Monsieur P. I shall not detain you five minutes, and you should know him, for he has some capital pictures and a collection of Limoges ware that is the despair of the dilettanti. So saying, they turned down by the place of the Madeleine, and soon entered the court of the hotel of Monsieur P. That gentleman received them in his gallery. After some general conversation, Coningsby turned towards the pictures, and left Sidonia with their host. The collection was rare, and interested Coningsby, though unacquainted with art. He sauntered on from picture to picture until he reached the end of the gallery, where an open door invited him into a suite of rooms, also full of pictures, an object of curiosity and art. As he was entering a second chamber, he observed a lady leaning back in a cushioned chair, and looking earnestly on a picture. His entrance was unheard and unnoticed, for the lady's back was to the door. Yet Coningsby, advancing in an angular direction, obtained nearly a complete view of her countenance. It was upraised, gazing on the picture with an expression of delight, the bonnet thrown back while the large sable cloak of the gazer had fallen partly off. The countenance was more beautiful than the beautiful picture. Those glowing shades of the gallery to which love and genius and devotion had lent their inspiration seemed without life and lustre by the radiant expression and expressive presence which Coningsby now beheld. 
The finely arched brow was a little elevated, the soft dark eyes were fully opened, the nostril of the delicate nose slightly dilated, the small yet rich full lips just parted, and over the clear transparent visage there played a vivid glance of gratified intelligence. The lady rose, advanced towards the picture, looked at it earnestly for a few moments, and then turning in a direction opposite to Coningsby, walked away. She was somewhat above the middle stature, and yet could scarcely be called tall, a quality so rare that even skilful dancers do not often possess it was hers, that elastic gait that is so winning and so often denotes the gaiety and quickness of the spirit. The fair object of his observation had advanced into other chambers, and as soon as it was becoming, Coningsby followed her. She had joined a lady and gentleman who were examining an ancient carving in ivory. The gentleman was middle-aged and portly, the elder lady tall and elegant, and with traces of interesting beauty. Coningsby heard her speak. The words were English, but the accent not of a native. In the remotest part of the room, Coningsby, apparently engaged in examining some of the famous Limoges ware of which Sidonia had spoken, watched with interest and intentness the beautiful being whom he had followed, and whom he concluded to be the child of her companions. After some little time they quitted the apartment on their return to the gallery. Coningsby remained behind, caring for none of the rare and fanciful objects that surrounded him, yet compelled, from the fear of seeming obtrusive, for some minutes to remain. Then he too returned to the gallery, and just as he had gained its end, he saw the portly gentleman in the distance shaking hands with Sidonia, the ladies apparently expressing their thanks and gratification to Monsieur P., and then all vanishing by the door through which Coningsby had originally entered. "'What a beautiful countrywoman of yours,' said Monsieur P., as Coningsby approached him. "'Is she my countrywoman? I am glad to hear it. I have been admiring her,' he replied. "'Yes,' said M. P., "'it is Sir Wallinger, one of your deputies. Don't you know him?' "'Sir Wallinger,' said Coningsby, "'no, I have not that honour. He looked at Sidonia. "'Sir Joseph Wallinger,' said Sidonia, "'is one of the new Whig baronets, and member for blank. I know him. He married a Spaniard.' That is not his daughter, but his niece, the child of his wife's sister. It is not easy to find any one more beautiful. End of chapter 8 End of book 5 Book 6, chapter 1 The knowledge that Sidonia was in Paris greatly agitated Lady Monmouth. She received the intimation indeed from Coningsby at dinner with sufficient art to conceal her emotion. Lord Monmouth himself was quite pleased at the announcement. Sidonia was his special favourite. He knew so much, had such an excellent judgment, and was so rich. He had always something to tell you, was the best man in the world to bet on, and never wanted anything. A perfect character according to the Monmouth ethics. In the evening of the day that Coningsby met Sidonia, Lady Monmouth made a little visit to the charming Duchess de G., who was at home every other night in her pretty hotel, with its embroidered white satin draperies, its fine old cabinets, and ancestral portraits of famous name, brave marshals and bright princesses of the olden time, on its walls. These receptions, without form, yet full of elegance, are what the English at homes were before the Continental War, though now, by a curious perversion of terms, the easy domestic title distinguishes in England a formally prepared and elaborately collected assembly, in which everything and every person are careful to be as little homely as possible. In France, on the contrary, it is on these occasions, and in this manner, that society carries on that degree and kind of intercourse which in England we attempt awkwardly to maintain by the medium of that unpopular species of visitation styled a morning call, which all complain that they have either to make or to endure. Nowhere was this species of reception more happily conducted than at the Duchess de G's. The rooms, though small, decorated with taste, brightly illumined, a handsome and gracious hostess, 
the duke the very pearl of gentlemen and sons and daughters worthy of such parents every moment some one came in and some one went away in your way from a dinner to a ball you stopped to exchange agreeable on dits it seemed that every woman was pretty every man a wit sure you were to find yourself surrounded by celebrities and men were welcomed there if they were clever before they were famous which showed it was a house that regarded intellect and did not seek merely to gratify its vanity by being surrounded by the distinguished enveloped in a rich indian shawl and leaning back on a sofa lady monmouth was engaged in conversation with the courtly and classic count m when on casually turning her head she observed entering the saloon sidonia she just caught his form bowing to the duchess and instantly turned her head and replunged into her conversation with increased interest lady monmouth was a person who had the power of seeing all about her everything and everybody without appearing to look she was conscious that sidonia was approaching her neighbourhood her heart beat in tumult she dreaded to catch the eye of that very individual whom she was so anxious to meet he was advancing towards the sofa instinctively lady monmouth turned from the count and began speaking earnestly to her other neighbour a young daughter of the house innocent and beautiful not yet quite fledged trying her wings in society under the maternal eye she was surprised by the extreme interest which her grand neighbour suddenly took in all her pursuits her studies her daily walks in the bois de boulogne sidonia as the marchioness had anticipated had now reached the sofa but no it was to the count and not to lady monmouth that he was advancing and they were immediately engaged in conversation after some little time when she had become accustomed to his voice and found her own heart throbbing with less violence lucretia turned again as if by accident to the count and met the glance of sidonia she meant to have received him with haughtiness but her self-command deserted her and slightly rising from the sofa she welcomed him with a countenance of extreme pallor and with some awkwardness his manner was such as might have assisted her even had she been more troubled it was marked by a degree of respectful friendliness he expressed without reserve his pleasure at meeting her again inquired much how she had passed her time since they last parted asked more than once after the marquis the count moved away sidonia took his seat his ease and homage combined greatly relieved her she expressed to him how kind her lord would consider his society for the marquis had suffered in health since sidonia last saw him his periodical gout had left him which made him ill and nervous the marquis received his friends at dinner every day sidonia particularly amiable offered himself as a guest for the following one and do you go to the great ball to-morrow inquired lucretia delighted with all that had occurred i always go to their ball said sidonia i have promised there was a momentary pause lucretia happier than she had been for a long time her face a little flushed and truly in a secret tumult of sweet thoughts remembered she had been long there and offering her hand to sidonia bade him adieu until to-morrow while he as was his custom soon repaired to the refined circle of the countess de c a lady whose manners he always mentioned as his fair ideal and whose house was his favourite haunt before to-morrow comes a word or two respecting two other characters of this history connected with the family of lord monmouth and first of flora la petite was neither very well nor very happy her hereditary disease developed itself gradually but in a manner alarming to those who loved her she was very delicate and suffered so much from the weakness of her chest that she was obliged to relinquish singing this was really the only tie between her and the marchioness who without being a petty tyrant treated her often with unfeeling haughtiness she was therefore now rarely seen in the chambers of the great in her own apartment she found indeed some distraction in music for which she had a natural predisposition but this was a pursuit that only fed the morbid passion of her tender soul alone listening only to sweet sounds 
or indulging in soft dreams that never could be realized her existence glided away like a vision and she seemed to become every day more fair and fragile alas hers was the sad and mystic destiny to love one whom she never met and by whom if she met him she would scarcely perhaps be recognized yet in that passion fanciful almost ideal her life was absorbed nor for her did the world contain an existence a thought a sensation beyond those that sprang from the image of the noble youth who had sympathized with her in her sorrows and had softened the hard fortunes of dependence by his generous sensibility happy that with many mortifications it was still her lot to live under the roof of one who bore his name and in whose veins flowed the same blood she felt indeed for the marquis whom she so rarely saw and from whom she had never received much notice prompted it would seem by her fantastic passion a degree of reverence almost of affection which seemed occasionally even to herself as something inexplicable and without reason as for her fond stepfather m villebecque the world fared very differently with him his lively and enterprising genius his ready and multiform talents and his temper which defied disturbance had made their way he had become the very right hand of lord monmouth his only counsellor his only confidant his secret agent the minister of his will and well did villebecque deserve this trust and ably did he maintain himself in the difficult position which he achieved there was nothing which villebecque did not know nothing which he could not do especially at paris he was master of his subject in all things the secret of success and without which however they may from accident dazzle the world the statesman the orator the author all alike feel the damning consciousness of being charlatans coningsby had made a visit to m villebecque and flora the day after his arrival it was a recollection and a courtesy that evidently greatly gratified them villebecque talked very much and amusingly and flora whom coningsby frequently addressed very little though she listened with great earnestness coningsby told her that he thought from all he heard she was too much alone and counselled her to gaiety but nature that had made her mild had denied her that constitutional liveliness of being which is the graceful property of french women she was a lily of the valley that loved seclusion and the tranquillity of virgin glades almost every day as he passed their entresol coningsby would look into villebecque's apartments for a moment to ask after flora End of chapter one chapter two sidonia was to dine at lord monmouth's the day after he met lucretia and afterwards they were all to meet at a ball much talked of and to which invitations were much sought and which was to be given that evening by the baroness s to r lord monmouth's dinners at paris were celebrated it was generally agreed that they had no rivals yet there were others who had as skilful cooks others who for such a purpose were equally profuse in their expenditure what then was the secret spell of his success the simplest in the world though no one seemed aware of it his lordship's plates were always hot whereas at paris in the best appointed houses and at dinners which for costly materials and admirable art in their preparation cannot be surpassed the effect is always considerably lessened and by a mode the most mortifying by the mere circumstance that every one at a french dinner is served on a cold plate the reason of a custom or rather a necessity which one would think a nation so celebrated for their gastronomical taste would recoil from is really it is believed that the ordinary french porcelain is so very inferior that it cannot endure the preparatory heat for dinner the common white pottery for example which is in general use and always found at the cafes will not bear vicinage to a brisk kitchen fire for half an hour now if we only had that treaty of commerce with france which has been so often on the point of completion the fabrics of our unrivalled potteries in exchange for their capital wines would be found throughout france the dinners of both nations would be improved the english would gain a delightful beverage 
and the French, for the first time in their lives, would dine off hot plates, an unanswerable instance of the advantages of commercial reciprocity. The guests at Lord Monmouth today were chiefly Carlists, individuals bearing illustrious names that animate the page of history and are indissolubly bound up with the glorious annals of their great country. They are the phantoms of a past but real aristocracy, an aristocracy that was founded on an intelligible principle which claimed great privileges for great purposes, whose hereditary duties were such that their possessors were perpetually in the eye of the nation, and who maintained, and in a certain point of view justified, their pre-eminence by constant illustration. It pleased Lord Monmouth to show great courtesies to a fallen race with whom he sympathized, whose fathers had been his friends in the days of his hot youth, whose mothers he had made love to, whose palaces had been his home, whose brilliant fates he remembered, whose fanciful splendor excited his early imagination, and whose magnificent and wanton luxury had developed his own predisposition for boundless enjoyment. Soubise and his suppers, his cutlets and his mistresses, the profuse and embarrassed de l'orager, who sighed for the entire ruin as for a strange luxury which perpetually eluded his grasp. These were the heroes of the olden time that Lord Monmouth worshipped, the wisdom of our ancestors which he appreciated, and he turned to their recollection for relief from the vulgar prudence of the degenerate days on which he had fallen, days when nobles must be richer than other men, or they cease to have any distinction. It was impossible not to be struck by the effective appearance of Lady Monmouth as she received her guests in grand toilet preparatory to the ball, white satin and miniver, a brilliant tiara. Her fine form, her costume of a fashion as perfect as its materials were sumptuous, and her presence always commanding and distinguished, produced a general effect to which few could be insensible. It was the triumph of mean over mere beauty of countenance. The hotel of Madame S. de R. is not more distinguished by its profuse decoration than by the fine taste which has guided the vast expenditure. Its halls of arabesque are almost without a rival. There is not the slightest embellishment in which the hand and feeling of art are not recognized. The rooms were very crowded. Everybody distinguished in Paris was there the lady of the court, the duchess of the faubourg, the wife of the financier, the constitutional throne, the old monarchy, the modern bourse, were alike represented. Marshals of the empire, ministers of the crown, dukes and marquises whose ancestors lounged in the oeil de boeuf, diplomatists of all countries, eminent foreigners of all nations, deputies who led sections, members of learned and scientific academies, occasionally a stray poet, a sea of sparkling tiaras, brilliant bouquets, glittering stars, and glowing ribbons, many beautiful faces, many famous ones, unquestionably the general air of a first-rate Parisian saloon on a great occasion is not easily equalled. In London there is not the variety of guests, nor the same size and splendor of saloons. Our houses are too small for reception." Coningsby, who had stolen away from his grandfather's before the rest of the guests, was delighted with the novelty of the splendid scene. He had been in Paris long enough to make some acquaintances, and mostly with celebrated personages. In his long, fruitless endeavour to enter the saloon in which they danced, he found himself hustled against the illustrious Baron von H., whom he had sat next to at a dinner a few days before at Count M.'s. "'It is more difficult than cutting through the Isthmus of Panama, Baron,' said Coningsby, alluding to a past conversation. "'Infinitely,' replied M. de H., smiling, "'for I would undertake to cut through the Isthmus, and I cannot engage that I shall enter this ballroom.' Time, however, brought Coningsby into that brilliant chamber. What a blaze of light and loveliness! How coquettish are the costumes! How vivid the flowers! To sounds of stirring melody, beautiful beings move with grace. Grace, indeed, is beauty in action. Here, where all are fair and everything is attractive, his eye is suddenly arrested by one object, 
a form of surpassing grace among the graceful, among the beauteous a countenance of unrivalled beauty. She was young among the youthful, a face of sunshine amid all that artificial light, her head placed upon her finely moulded shoulders with a queen-like grace, a coronet of white roses on her dark brown hair her only ornament. It was the beauty of the picture gallery. The eye of Coningsby never quitted her. When the dance ceased he had an opportunity of seeing her nearer. He met her walking with her cavalier, and he was conscious that she observed him. Finally he remarked that she resumed a seat next to the lady whom he had mistaken for her mother, but had afterwards understood to be Lady Wallinger. Coningsby returned to the other saloons. He witnessed the entrance and reception of Lady Monmouth, who moved on towards the ballroom. Soon after this Sidonia arrived. He came in with a still handsome and ever courteous Duke D. Observing Coningsby, he stopped to present him to the Duke. While thus conversing, the Duke, who was fond of the English, observed, "'See here your beautiful countrywoman that all the world are talking of. That is her uncle. He brings to me letters from one of your lords, whose name I cannot recollect.' And Sir Joseph and his lovely niece veritably approached. The Duke addressed them, asked them in the name of his Duchess to a concert on the next Thursday, and after a thousand compliments moved on. Sidonia stopped. Coningsby could not refrain from lingering, but stood a little apart, and was about to move away when there was a whisper, of which, without hearing a word, he could not resist the impression that he was the subject. He felt a little embarrassed, and was retiring when he heard Sidonia reply to an inquiry of the lady, the same, and then, turning to Coningsby, said aloud, "'Coningsby, Miss Milbank says that you have forgotten her.' Coningsby started, advanced, coloured a little, could not conceal his surprise. The lady, too, though more prepared, was not without confusion, and for an instant looked down. Coningsby recalled at that moment the long dark eyelashes and the beautiful bashful countenance that had so charmed him at Millbank. But two years had otherwise effected a wonderful change in the sister of his school-day friend, and transformed the silent, embarrassed girl into a woman of surpassing beauty and of the most graceful and impressive mien. "'It is not surprising that Mr. Coningsby should not recollect my niece,' said Sir Joseph, addressing Sidonia, and wishing to cover their mutual embarrassment. "'But it is impossible for her, or for any one connected with her, not to be anxious at all times to express to him our sense of what we all owe him.' Coningsby and Miss Milbank were now in full routine conversation, consisting of questions. How long she had been at Paris, when she had heard last from Milbank, how her father was, also how was her brother. Sidonia made an observation to Sir Joseph on a passer-by, and then himself moved on, Coningsby accompanying his new friends in a contrary direction to the refreshment room to which they were proceeding. "'And you have passed a winter at Rome,' said Coningsby. "'How I envy you! I feel that I shall never be able to travel.' "'And why not? Life has become so stirring that there is ever some great cause that keeps one at home. Life, on the contrary, so swift that all may see now that of which they could once only read.' "'The golden and silver sides of the shield,' said Coningsby with a smile. "'And you, like a good knight, will maintain your own.' No, I would follow yours. You have not heard lately from Oswald. Oh, yes, I think there are no such faithful correspondents as we are. I only wish we could meet. You will soon, but he is such a devotee of Oxford, quite a monk, and you too, Mr. Coningsby, are much occupied. Yes, and at the same time as Millbank. I was in hopes, when I once paid you a visit, I might have found your brother." "'But that was such a rapid visit,' said Miss Milbank. "'I always remember it with delight,' said Coningsby. "'You were willing to be pleased, but Milbank, notwithstanding Rome, commands my affections, and in spite of this surrounding splendour I could have wished to have passed my Christmas in Lancashire. "'Mr. Milbank has lately purchased a very beautiful place in the country. I became acquainted with Hellingsley when staying at my grandfather's.' "'Ah, I have never seen it. 
Indeed, I was much surprised that papa became its purchaser, because he will never live there, and Oswald, I am sure, could never be tempted to quit Millbank. You know what enthusiastic ideas he had of his order. Like all his ideas, sound and high and pure, I always duly appreciated your brother's great abilities, and what is far more important, his lofty mind. When I recollect our Eton days, I cannot understand how more than two years have passed away without our being together. I am sure the fault is mine. I might now have been at Oxford instead of Paris. And yet, added Coningsby, that would have been a sad mistake, since I should not have had the happiness of being here." "'Oh, yes, that would have been a sad mistake,' said Miss Millbank. "'Edith,' said Sir Joseph, rejoining his niece, from whom he had been momentarily separated, "'Edith, this is Monsieur Thiers.' In the meantime Sidonia reached the ballroom, and sitting near the entrance was Lady Monmouth, who immediately addressed him. He was, as usual, intelligent and unimpassioned, and yet not without a delicate deference which is flattering to women, especially if not altogether unworthy of it. Sidonia always admired Lucretia, and preferred her society to that of most persons. But the lady was in error in supposing that she had conquered or could vanquish his heart. Sidonia was one of those men, not so rare as may be supposed, who shrink above all things from an adventure of gallantry with a woman in a position. He had neither time nor temper for sentimental circumvolutions. He detested the diplomacy of passion, protocols, protracted negotiations, conferences, correspondence, treaties projected, ratified, violated. He had no genius for the tactics of intrigue, your reconnoitrings and marchings and countermarchings, sappings and minings, assaults, sometimes surrenders and sometimes repulses. All the solemn and studied hypocrisies were to him infinitely wearisome, and if the movements were not merely formal, they irritated him, distracted his feelings, disturbed the tenor of his mind, deranged his nervous system. Something of the old oriental vein influenced him in his carriage towards women. He was oftener behind the scenes of the opera house than in his box. He delighted, too, in the society of Hetairai, Aspasia was his heroine. Obliged to appear much in what is esteemed pure society, he cultivated the acquaintance of clever women because they interested him, but in such saloons his feminine acquaintances were merely psychological. No lady could accuse him of trifling with her feelings, however decided might be his predilection for her conversation. He yielded at once to an admirer, never trespassed by any chance into the domain of sentiment, never broke by any accident or blunder into the irregular paces of flirtation, was a man who notoriously would never diminish by marriage the purity of his race, and one who always maintained that passion and polished life were quite incompatible. He liked the drawing-room, and he liked the desert but he would not consent that either should trench on their mutual privileges. The Princess Lucretia had yielded herself to the spell of Sidonia's society at Coningsby Castle, when she knew that marriage was impossible. But she loved him, and with an Italian spirit. Now they met again, and she was the Marchioness of Monmouth, a very great lady, very much admired, and followed, and courted, and very powerful. It is our great moralist who tells us in the immortal page that an affair of gallantry with the great lady is more delightful than with ladies of a lower degree. In this he contradicts the good old ballad, but certain it is that Dr. Johnson announced to Boswell, Sir, in the case of a countess, the imagination is more excited. But Sidonia was a man on whom the conventional superiorities of life produced as little effect as a flake falling on the glaciers of the high Alps. His comprehension of the world and human nature was too vast and complete. He understood too well the relative value of things to appreciate anything but essential excellence, and that not too much. A charming woman was not more charming to him, because she chanced to be an empress in a particular district of one of the smallest planets. 
A charming woman under any circumstances was not a unique animal. When Sidonia felt a disposition to be spellbound, he used to review in his memory all the charming women of whom he had read in the books of all literatures, and whom he had known himself in every court and clime, and the result of his reflections ever was that the charming woman in question was by no means the paragon which some who had read, seen, and thought less might have been inclined to esteem her. There was indeed no subject on which Sidonia discoursed more felicitously as on woman, and none on which Lord Eskdale more frequently endeavoured to attract him. He would tell you Talmudical stories about our mother Eve and the Queen of Sheba, which would have astonished you. There was not a free lady of Greece, Leontium and Phryne, Laius, Danae, and Lamia, the Egyptian girl Thonis, respecting whom he could not tell you as many diverting tales as if they were ladies of Loretto. Not a nook of Athensius, not an obscure scholiast, not a passage in a Greek orator that could throw light on these personages which was not at his command. What stories he could tell you about Mark Antony and the actress Cytheris in their chariot drawn by tigers! What a character would he paint of that flora who gave her gardens to the Roman people! It would draw tears to your eyes. No man was ever so learned in the female manners of the last centuries of polytheism as Sidonia. You would have supposed that he had devoted his studies peculiarly to that period, if you had not chanced to draw him to the Italian Middle Ages. And even these startling revelations were almost eclipsed by his anecdotes of the court of Henry the Third of France, with every character of which he was as familiar as with the brilliant groups that at this moment filled the saloons of Madame de R. End of chapter 2book six chapter three of coningsby or the new generation by benjamin disraeli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the image of edith millbank was the last thought of coningsby as he sank into an agitated slumber to him had hitherto in general been accorded the precious boon of dreamless sleep homer tells us these phantasms come from jove they are rather the children of a distracted soul. Coningsby this night lived much in past years, varied by painful perplexities of the present which he could neither subdue nor comprehend. The scene flitted from Eton to the castle of his grandfather, and then he found himself among the pictures of the Rue de Tranchet, but their owner bore the features of the senior Millbank. A beautiful countenance that was alternately the face in the mysterious picture and then that of Edith, haunted him under all circumstances. He woke little refreshed, restless, and yet sensible of some secret joy. He woke to think of her of whom he had dreamed. The light had dawned on his soul. Coningsby loved. Ah, what is that ambition that haunts our youth, that thirst for power or that lust for fame, that forces us from obscurity into the sun-blaze of the world? What are these sentiments so high, so vehement, so ennobling? They vanish, and in an instant, before the glance of a woman. Coningsby had scarcely quitted her side the preceding eve. He hung upon the accents of that clear, sweet voice, and sought with tremulous fascination the gleaming splendour of those soft, dark eyes. And now he sat in his chamber, with his eyes fixed on vacancy, all thoughts and feelings, pursuits, desires, life, merge in one absorbing sentiment. It is impossible to exist without seeing her again, and instantly. He had requested and gained permission to call on Lady Wallinger. He would not lose a moment in availing himself of it. As early as was tolerably decorous, and before, in all probability, they could quit their hotel, Coningsby repaired to the Rue de Rivoli, to pay his respects to his new friends. 
as he walked along he indulged in fanciful speculations which connected edith and the mysterious portrait of his mother he felt himself as it were near the fulfilment of some fate and on the threshold of some critical discovery he recalled the impatient even alarmed expressions of rigby at montem six years ago when he proposed to invite young millbank to his grandfather's dinner the vindictive feud that existed between the two families and for which political opinion or even party passion could not satisfactorily account and he reasoned himself into a conviction that the solution of many perplexities was at hand and that all would be consummated to the satisfaction of every one by his unexpected but inevitable agency coningsby found sir joseph alone the worthy baronet was at any rate no participator in mr millbank's vindictive feelings against lord monmouth on the contrary he had a very high respect for a marquis whatever might be his opinions and no mean consideration for a marquis's grandson sir joseph had inherited a large fortune made by commerce and had increased it by the same means he was a middle-class whig had faithfully supported the party in his native town during the days they wandered in the wilderness and had well earned his share of the milk and honey when they had vanquished the promised land in the spring-tide of liberalism when the world was not analytical of free opinions and odious distinctions were not drawn between finality men and progressive reformers mr wallinger had been the popular leader of a powerful body of his fellow-citizens who had returned him to the first reformed parliament and where in spite of many a menacing registration he had contrived to remain he had never given a radical vote without the permission of the secretary of the treasury and was not afraid of giving an unpopular one to serve his friends he was not like that distinguished liberal who after dining with the late whig premier expressed his gratification and his gratitude by assuring his lordship that he might count on his support on all popular questions i want men who will support the government on all unpopular questions replied the witty statesman mr wallinger was one of these men his high character and strong purse were always in the front rank in the hour of danger his support in the house was limited to his votes but in other places equally important at a meeting of a political club or in downing street he could find his tongue take what is called a practical view of a question adopt what is called an independent tone reanimate confidence in ministers check mutiny and set a bright and bold example to the wavering a man of his property and high character and sound views so practical and so independent this was evidently the block from which a baronet should be cut and in due time he figured sir joseph a spanish gentleman of ample means and of a good catalan family flying during a political convulsion in england arrived with his two daughters at liverpool and bore letters of introduction to the house of wallinger some little time after this by one of those stormy vicissitudes of political fortune of late years not unusual in the peninsula he returned to his native country and left his children and the management of that portion of his fortune that he had succeeded in bringing with him under the guardianship of the father of the present sir joseph this gentleman was about again to become an exile when he met with an untimely end in one of those terrible tumults of which barcelona is the frequent scene the younger wallinger was touched by the charms of one of his father's wards her beauty of a character to which he was unaccustomed her accomplishments of society and the refinement of her manners conspicuous in the circle in which he lived captivated him and though they had no heir the union had been one of great felicity sir joseph was proud of his wife he secretly considered himself though his tone was as liberal and independent as in old days to be on the threshold of aristocracy and was conscious that lady wallinger played her part not unworthily in the elevated circles in which they now frequently found themselves sir joseph was fond of great people and not averse to travel 
because bearing a title and being a member of the British Parliament, and always moving with the appendages of wealth, servants, carriages, and couriers, and fortified with no lack of letters from the Foreign Office, he was everywhere acknowledged and received and treated as a personage, was invited to court balls, dined with ambassadors, and found himself and his lady at every festival of distinction. The elder Millbank had been Joseph Wallinger's youthful friend. Different as were their dispositions and the rate of their abilities, their political opinions were the same, and commerce habitually connected their interests. During a visit to Liverpool, Millbank had made the acquaintance of the sister of Lady Wallinger, and had been a successful tutor for her hand. This lady was the mother of Edith and of the schoolfellow of Coningsby. It was only within a very few years that she had died. She had scarcely lived long enough to complete the education of her daughter, to whom she was devoted, and on whom she lavished the many accomplishments that she possessed. Lady Wallinger, having no children, and being very fond of her niece, had watched over Edith with infinite solicitude, and finally had persuaded Mr. Millbank that it would be well that his daughter should accompany them in their somewhat extensive travels. It was not, therefore, only that nature had developed a beautiful woman out of a bashful girl since Coningsby's visit to Millbank, but really every means and every opportunity that could contribute to render an individual capable of adorning the most accomplished circles of life had naturally and without effort fallen to the fortunate lot of the manufacturer's daughter. Edith possessed an intelligence equal to those occasions. Without losing the native simplicity of her character, which sprang from the heart, and which the strong and original bent of her father's mind had fostered, she had imbibed all the refinement and facility of the polished circles in which she moved. She had a clear head, a fine taste, and a generous spirit, had received so much admiration that though by no means insensible to homage, her heart was free, was strongly attached to her family, and notwithstanding all the splendour of Rome and the brilliancy of Paris, her thoughts were often in her Saxon valley amid the green hills and busy factories of Millbank. Sir Joseph, finding himself alone with the grandson of Lord Monmouth, was not very anxious that the ladies should immediately appear. He thought this a good opportunity of getting at what are called the real feelings of the Tory party, and he began to pump with a seductive semblance of frankness. For his part, he had never doubted that a conservative government was ultimately inevitable, had told Lord John so two years ago, and between themselves Lord John was of the same opinion. The present position of the Whigs was the necessary fate of all progressive parties, could not see exactly how it would end, thought sometimes it must end in a fusion of parties, but could not well see how that could be brought about at least at present. For his part, should be happy to witness a union of the best men of all parties for the preservation of peace and order without any reference to particular opinions and in that sense of the word it was not at all impossible that he might find it his duty some day to support a conservative government. Sir Joseph was much astonished when Coningsby, who being somewhat impatient for the entrance of the ladies, was rather more abrupt than was his wont, told the worthy baronet that he looked upon a government without distinct principles of policy as only a stop-gap to a widespread and demoralizing anarchy, that he for one could not comprehend how a free government could endure without national opinions to uphold it, and that governments for the preservation of peace and order and nothing else had better be sought in China or among the Austrians, the Chinese of Europe. As for conservative government, the natural question was, what do you mean to conserve? Do you mean to conserve things, or only names, realities, or merely appearances? Or do you mean to continue the system commenced in 1834, and with a hypocritical reverence for the principles, and a superstitious adhesion to the forms of the old exclusive constitution, 
carry on your policy by latitudinarian practice? Sir Joseph stared. It was the first time that any inkling of the views of the new generation had caught his ear. They were strange and unaccustomed accents. He was extremely perplexed, could by no means make out what his companion was driving at. At length, with a rather knowing smile, expressive as much of compassion as comprehension, he remarked, "'Ah, I see, you are a regular orangeman.' "'I look upon an orangeman,' said Coningsby, "'as a pure Whig, the only professor and practiser of unadulterated Whiggism.' This was too much for Sir Joseph, whose political knowledge did not reach much further back than the Ministry of the Mediocrities, hardly touched the times of the corresponding society, but he was a cautious man, and never replied in haste. He was about feeling his way when he experienced the golden advantage of gaining time for the ladies entered. The heart of Coningsby throbbed as Edith appeared. She extended to him her hand, her face radiant with kind expression. Lady Wallinger seemed gratified also by his visit. She had much elegance in her manner, a calm, soft address, and she spoke English with a sweet Doric irregularity. They all sat down, talked of the last night's ball, of a thousand things. There was something animating in the frank, cheerful spirit of Edith, she had a quick eye both for the beautiful and the ridiculous, and threw out her observations in terse and vivid phrases. An hour, and more than an hour, passed away, and Coningsby still found some excuse not to depart. It seemed that on this morning they were about to make an expedition into the antique city of Paris, to visit some old hotels which retained their character, especially they had heard much of the hotel of the Archbishop of Sens, with its fortified courtyard. Coningsby expressed great interest in the subject, and showed some knowledge. Sir Joseph invited him to join the party, which of all things in the world was what he most desired. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Not a day elapsed without Coningsby being in the company of Edith, Time was precious for him, for the spires and pinnacles of Cambridge already began to loom in the distance, and he resolved to make the most determined efforts not to lose a day of his liberty. And yet to call every morning in the Rue de Rivoli was an exploit which surpassed even the audacity of love. More than once, making the attempt, his courage failed him, and he turned into the gardens of the Tuileries, and only watched the windows of the house. Circumstances, however, favoured him. He received a letter from Oswald Milbank. He was bound to communicate in person this evidence of his friend's existence, and when he had to reply to the letter, he must necessarily inquire whether his friend's relatives had any message to transmit to him. These, however, were only slight advantages. What assisted Coningsby in his plans and wishes was the great pleasure which Sidonia, with whom he passed a great deal of his time, took in the society of the Wallingers and their niece. Sidonia presented Lady Wallinger with his opera box during her stay at Paris, invited them frequently to his agreeable dinner parties, and announced his determination to give a ball, which Lady Wallinger esteemed a delicate attention to Edith while Lady Monmouth flattered herself that the festival sprang from the desire she had expressed of seeing the celebrated hotel of Sidonia to advantage. Coningsby was very happy. His morning visits to the Rue de Rivoli seemed always welcome, and seldom an evening elapsed in which he did not find himself in the society of Edith. She seemed not to wish to conceal that his presence gave her pleasure, and although she had many admirers, and had an airy graciousness for all of them, Coningsby sometimes indulged the exquisite suspicion that there was a flattering distinction in her carriage to himself. Under the influence of these feelings, he began daily to be more conscious that separation would be an intolerable calamity. He began to meditate upon the feasibility of keeping half a term, and of postponing his departure to Cambridge to a period nearer the time when Edith would probably return to England. 
In the meanwhile, the Parisian world talked much of the grand fete which was about to be given by Sidonia. Coningsby heard much of it one day when dining at his grandfather's. Lady Monmouth seemed very intent on the occasion. Even Lord Monmouth half talked of going, though for his part he wished people would come to him and never ask him to their houses. That was his idea of society. He liked the world, but he liked to find it under his own roof. He grudged them nothing, so that they would not insist upon the reciprocity of cold-catching, and would eat his good dinners instead of insisting on his eating their bad ones. "'But M. Sidonia's cook is a gem, they say,' observed an attaché of an embassy. "'I have no doubt of it. Sidonia is a man of sense, almost the only man of sense I know. I never caught him tripping. He never makes a false move. Sidonia is exactly the sort of man I like. You know you cannot deceive him, and that she does not want to deceive you. I wish he liked a rubber more. Then he would be perfect.' "'They say he is going to be married,' said the attaché. "Pooh," said Lord Monmouth. "'Married!' exclaimed Lady Monmouth. "'To whom?' "'To your beautiful countrywoman, la belle Anglaise, that all the world talks of,' said the attaché. "'And who may she be, pray?' said the Marquis. "'I have so many beautiful countrywomen.' "'Mademoiselle Milbank,' said the attaché. "'Milbank,' said the Marquis, with a lowering brow. "'There are so many Milbanks. "'Do you know what Milbank this is, Harry?' "'He inquired of his grandson, "'who had listened to the conversation "'with rather an embarrassed and even agitated spirit. "'What, sir? Yes, Milbank,' said Coningsby. "'I say, do you know who this Milbank is?' "'Oh, Miss Milbank, yes, I believe. "'That is, I know a daughter of the gentleman "'who purchased some property near you.' "'Oh, that fellow! Has he got a daughter here?' "'The most beautiful girl in Paris,' said the attaché. "'Lady Monmouth, have you seen this beauty that Sidonia is going to marry?' he added, with a fiendish laugh. "'I have seen the young lady,' said Lady Monmouth, "'but I had not heard that Monsieur Sidonia was about to marry her.' "'Is she so very beautiful?' inquired another gentleman. "'Yes,' said Lady Monmouth, calm but pale.' Pooh, said the Marquis again. I assure you that it is a fact, said the attaché, not at least an on -dit. I have it from a quarter that could not well be mistaken. Behold a little snatch of ordinary dinner gossip that left a very painful impression on the minds of three individuals who were present. The name of Milbank revived in Lord Monmouth's mind a sense of defeat, discomfiture, and disgust. Hellingsley, lost elections, and Mr. Rigby, three subjects which Lord Monmouth had succeeded for a time in expelling from his sensations. His lordship thought that, in all probability, this beauty of whom they spoke so highly was not really the daughter of his foe, that it was some confusion which had arisen from the similarity of names. Nor did he believe that Sidonia was going to marry her, whoever she might be but a variety of things had been said at dinner, and a number of images had been raised in his mind that touched his spleen. He took his wine freely, and, the usual consequence of that proceeding with Lord Monmouth, became silent and sullen. As for Lady Monmouth, she had learned that Sidonia, whatever might be the result, was paying very marked attention to another woman, for whom undoubtedly he was giving that very ball which she had flattered herself was a homage to her wishes, and for which she had projected a new dress of eclipsing splendour. Coningsby felt quite sure that the story of Sidonia's marriage with Edith was the most ridiculous idea that ever entered into the imagination of man. At least he thought he felt quite sure. But the idlest and wildest report that the woman you love is about to marry another is not comfortable. Besides, he could not conceal from himself that between the Wallinges and Sidonia there existed a remarkable intimacy fully extended to their niece. He had seen her certainly on more than one occasion in lengthened and apparently earnest conversation with Sidonia, 
who, by the by, spoke with her often in Spanish, and never concealed his admiration of her charms or the interest he found in her society. And Edith, what, after all, had passed between Edith and himself, which should at all gainsay this report, which he had been particularly assured was not a mere report, but came from a quarter that could not well be mistaken. She had received him with kindness, and how should she receive one who was the friend and preserver of her only brother, and apparently the intimate and cherished acquaintance of her future husband? Coningsby felt that sickness of the heart that accompanies one's first misfortune. The illusions of life seemed to dissipate and disappear. He was miserable. He had no confidence in himself, in his future. After all, what was he? A dependent on a man of very resolute will and passions. Could he forget the glance with which Lord Monmouth caught the name of Millbank, and received the intimation of Hellingsley? It was a glance for a Spagnoletto or a Caravaggio to catch and immortalize. Why, if Edith were not going to marry Sidonia, how was he ever to marry her, even if she cared for him? Oh, what a future of unbroken, continuous, interminable misery awaited him! Was there ever yet born a being with a destiny so dark and dismal? He was the most forlorn of men, utterly wretched. He had entirely mistaken his own character. He had no energy, no abilities, not a single eminent quality. All was over. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 It was fated that Lady Monmouth should not be present at that ball, the anticipation of which had occasioned her so much pleasure and some pangs. On the morning after that slight conversation, which had so disturbed the souls, though unconsciously to each other, of herself and Coningsby, the Marquis was driving Lucretia up the Avenue Marigny in his Phaeton. About the centre of the avenue the horses took fright and started off at a wild pace. The Marquis was an experienced whip, calm and with exertion still very powerful. He would have soon mastered the horses, had not one of the reins unhappily broken. The horses swerved, the Marquis kept his seat, Lucretia, alarmed, sprang up, the carriage was dashed against the trunk of a tree, and she was thrown out of it at the very instant that one of the outriders had succeeded in heading the equipage and checking the horses. The Marchioness was senseless. Lord Monmouth had descended from the Phaeton, several passengers had assembled, the door of a contiguous house was opened, there were offers of service, sympathy, inquiries, a babble of tongues, great confusion. "'Get surgeons and send for her maid,' said Lord Monmouth to one of the servants. In the midst of this distressing tumult, Sidonia, on horseback, followed by a groom, came up the avenue from the Champs-Élysées. The empty phaeton, reins broken, horses held by strangers, all the appearances of a misadventure attracted him. He recognized the livery. He instantly dismounted. Moving aside the crowd, he perceived Lady Monmouth, senseless and prostrate, and her husband without assistance, restraining the injudicious efforts of the bystanders. "'Let us carry her in, Lord Monmouth,' said Sidonia, exchanging a recognition as he took Lucretia in his arms, and bore her into the dwelling that was at hand. Those who were standing at the door assisted him. The woman of the house and Lord Monmouth only were present. "'I would hope there is no fracture,' said Sidonia, placing her on a sofa. "'Nor does it appear to me that the percussion of the head, though considerable, could have been fatally violent. I have caught her pulse. Keep her in a horizontal position, and she will soon come to herself.' The Marquis seated himself in a chair by the side of the sofa, which Sidonia had advanced to the middle of the room. Lord Monmouth was silent and very serious. Sidonia opened the window and touched the brow of Lucretia with water. At this moment M. Villebecque and a surgeon entered the chamber. "'The brain cannot be affected with that pulse,' said the surgeon. "'There is no fracture.' "'How pale she is,' said Lord Monmouth, as if he were examining a picture. "'The colour seems to me to return,' said Sidonia. 
The surgeon applied some restoratives, which he had brought with him. The face of the marchioness showed signs of life. She stirred. She revived, said the surgeon. The marchioness breathed with some force, again, then half opened her eyes, and then instantly closed them. "'If I could but get her to take this draught," said the surgeon. "'Stop, moisten her lips first, said Sidonia. They placed the draught to her mouth. In a moment she put forth her hand as if to repress them, then opened her eyes again and sighed. "'She is herself,' said the surgeon. "'Lucretia,' said the Marquis. "'Sidonia,' said the Marchioness. Lord Monmouth looked round to invite his friend to come forward. "'Lady Monmouth,' said Sidonia, in a gentle voice. She started, rose a little on the sofa, stared around her. "'Where am I?' she exclaimed. "'With me,' said the Marquis, and he bent forward to her and took her hand. "'Sidonia?' she again exclaimed, in a voice of inquiry. "'Is here,' said Lord Monmouth. "'He carried you in after our accident.' "'Accident? Why is he going to marry?' The Marquis took a pinch of snuff. There was an awkward pause in the chamber. "'I think now,' said Sidonia to the surgeon, "'that Lady Monmouth would take the draught. She refused it. "'Try you, Sidonia,' said the Marquis rather dryly. "'You feel yourself again?' said Sidonia, advancing. "'Would I did not,' said the Marchioness, with an air of stupor. "'What has happened? Why am I here? Are you married?' she wanders a little said sidonia the marquis took another pinch of snuff i could have borne even repulsion said lady monmouth in a voice of desolation but not for another monsieur villebecque said the marquis my lord lord monmouth looked at him with that irresistible scrutiny which would daunt a galley slave and then after a short pause said the carriage should have arrived by this time let us get home. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 After the conversation at dinner which we have noticed, the restless and disquieted Coningsby wandered about Paris, vainly seeking in the distraction of a great city some relief from the excitement of his mind. His first resolution was immediately to depart for England, but when, on reflection, he was mindful that, after all, the assertion which had so agitated him might really be without foundation, in spite of many circumstances that to his regardful fancy seemed to accredit it, his firm resolution began to waver. These were the first pangs of jealousy that Coningsby had ever experienced, and they revealed to him the immensity of the stake which he was hazarding on a most uncertain die. The next morning he called in the Rue Rivoli, and was informed that the family were not at home. He was returning, under the arcades, towards the Rue Saint-Florentin, when Sidonia passed him in an opposite direction, on horseback and at a rapid rate. Coningsby, who was not observed by him, could not resist a strange temptation to watch for a moment his progress. He saw him enter the court of the hotel where the Wallinger family were staying. Would he come forth immediately? No. Coningsby stood still and pale. Minute followed minute. Coningsby flattered himself that Sidonia was only speaking to the porter. Then he would fain believe Sidonia was writing a note. Then, crossing the street, he mounted by some steps the terrace of the Tuileries, nearly opposite the hotel of the Minister of Finance, and watched the house. A quarter of an hour elapsed. Sidonia did not come forth. They were at home to him, only to him. Sick at heart, infinitely wretched, scarcely able to guide his steps, dreading even to meet an acquaintance, and almost feeling that his tongue would refuse the office of conversation, he contrived to meet his grandfather's hotel, and was about to bury himself in his chamber, when on the staircase he met Flora. Coningsby had not seen her for the last fortnight. Seeing her now, his heart smote him for his neglect, excusable as it really was. Any one else at this time he would have hurried by without a recognition, but the gentle and suffering Flora was too meek to be rudely treated by so kind a heart as Coningsby's. He looked at her. She was pale and agitated. Her step trembled while she still hastened on. 
"'What is the matter?' inquired Coningsby. "'My lord, the Marchioness are in danger, thrown from their carriage.' Briefly she detailed to Coningsby all that had occurred, that M. Villebecque had already repaired to them, that she herself only this moment had learned the intelligence that seemed to agitate her to the centre. Coningsby instantly turned with her, but they had scarcely emerged from the courtyard when the carriage approached that brought Lord and Lady Monmouth home. They followed it into the court. They were immediately at its door. "'All is right, Harry,' said the Marquis, calm and grave. Coningsby pressed his grandfather's hand. Then he assisted Lucretia to alight. "'I am quite well,' she said, now. "'But you must lean on me, dearest Lady Monmouth,' Coningsby said in a tone of tenderness, as he felt Lucretia almost sinking from him, and he supported her into the hall of the hotel. Lord Monmouth had lingered behind. Flora crept up to him, and with unwanted boldness offered her arm to the Marquis. He looked at her with a glance of surprise, and then a softer expression, one indeed of an almost winning sweetness, which, though rare, was not a stranger to his countenance, melted his features, and taking the arm so humbly presented, he said, "'Ma petite, you look more frightened than any of us. Poor child!' He had reached the top of the flight of steps. He withdrew his arm from Flora, and thanked her with all his courtesy. "'You are not hurt, then, sir?' she ventured to ask with a look that expressed the infinite solicitude which her tongue did not venture to convey. "'By no means, my good little girl,' and he extended his hand to her, which she reverently bent over and embraced. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 When Coningsby had returned to his grandfather's hotel that morning, it was with the determination to leave Paris the next day for England. But the accident to Lady Monmouth, though, as it ultimately appeared, accompanied by no very serious consequences, quite dissipated this intention. It was impossible to quit them so crudely at such a moment. So he remained another day, and that was the day preceding Sidonia's fate, which he particularly resolved not to attend. He felt it quite impossible that he could again endure the sight of either Sidonia or Edith. He looked upon them as persons who had deeply injured him, though they were really individuals who had treated him with invariable kindness. But he felt their existence was a source of mortification and misery to him. With these feelings, sauntering away the last hours at Paris, disquieted, uneasy, no present, no future, no enjoyment, no hope, really, positively, undeniably unhappy, unhappy too for the first time in his life, the first unhappiness, what a companion piece for the first love. Coningsby, of all places in the world, in the gardens of the Luxembourg, encountered Sir Joseph Wallinger and Edith. To avoid them was impossible. They met face to face, and Sir Joseph stopped and immediately reminded him that it was three days since they had seen him, as if to reproach him for so unprecedented a neglect. And it seemed that Edith, though she said not as much, felt the same. And Coningsby turned round and walked with them, he told them he was going to leave Paris on the morrow. "'And Miss, Monsieur de Sidonia's fate, of which we have all talked so much,' said Edith, with unaffected surprise, and an expression of disappointment which she in vain attempted to conceal. "'The festival will not be less gay for my absence,' said Coningsby, with that plaintive moroseness not unusual to despairing lovers." "'If we were all to argue from the same premises and act accordingly,' said Edith, "'the saloons would be empty. But if any person's absence would be remarked, I should really have thought it would be yours. I thought you were one of Monsieur de Sidonia's great friends?' "'He has no friends,' said Coningsby. "'No wise man has. What are friends? Traitors!' Edith looked much astonished, and then she said, "'I am sure you have not quarrelled with Monsieur de Sidonia for we have just parted with him. I have no doubt you have, thought Coningsby. And it is impossible to speak of another in higher terms than he spoke of you. Sir Joseph observed how unusual it was for Monsieur de Sidonia to express himself so warmly. 
"'Sidonia is a great man and carries everything before him,' said Coningsby. "'I am nothing. I cannot cope with him. I retire from the field.' "'What field?' inquired Sir Joseph, who did not clearly catch the drift of these observations. "'It appears to me that a field for action is exactly what Sidonia wants. There is no vent for his abilities and intelligence.' He wastes his energy in travelling from capital to capital like a king's messenger. The morning after his fate he is going to Madrid. This brought some reference to their mutual movements. Edith spoke of a return to Lancashire, of her hope that Mr. Coningsby would soon see Oswald, but Mr. Coningsby informed her that though he was going to leave Paris he had no intention of returning to England that he had not yet quite made up his mind whither he should go, but thought that he should travel directly to St. Petersburg. He wished to travel overland to Astrakhan. That was the place he was particularly anxious to visit. After this incomprehensible announcement, they walked on for some minutes in silence, broken only by occasional monosyllables, with which Coningsby responded at hazard to the sound remarks of Sir Joseph. As they approached the palace, a party of English, who were visiting the chamber of peers, and who were acquainted with the companions of Coningsby, encountered them. Amid the mutual recognitions, Coningsby was about to take his leave somewhat ceremoniously, but Edith held forth her hand and said, "'Is this indeed farewell?' His heart was agitated, his countenance changed. He retained her hand amid the chattering tourists, too full of their criticisms and their egotistical commonplaces to notice what was passing. A sentimental ebullition seemed to be on the point of taking place. Their eyes met. The look of Edith was mournful and inquiring. "'We will say farewell at the ball,' said Coningsby, and she rewarded him with a radiant smile. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Sidonia lived in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, in a large hotel that in old days had belonged to the Crillon, but it had received at his hands such extensive alterations that nothing of the original decoration and little of its arrangement remained. A flight of marble steps, ascending from a vast court, led into a hall of great dimensions, which was at the same time an orangery and a gallery of sculpture. It was illumined by a distinct yet soft and subdued light which harmonized with the beautiful repose of the surrounding forms, and with the exotic perfume that was wafted about. A gallery led from this hall to an inner hall of quite a different character, fantastic, glittering, variegated, full of strange shapes and dazzling objects. The roof was carved and gilt in that honeycomb style prevalent in the Saracenic buildings. The walls were hung with leather stamped in rich and vivid patterns, the floor was a flood of mosaic. About were statues of negroes of human size, with faces of wild expression, and holding in their outstretched hands silver torches that blazed with an almost painful brilliancy. From this inner hall a double staircase of white marble led to the grand suite of apartments. These saloons, lofty, spacious, and numerous, had been decorated principally in encaustic by the most celebrated artists of Munich. The three principal rooms were only separated from each other by columns, covered with rich hangings, on this night drawn aside. The decoration of each chamber was appropriate to its purpose. On the walls of the ballroom, nymphs and heroes moved in measure in Sicilian landscapes or on the azure shore of Aegean waters. From the ceiling, beautiful divinities threw garlands on the guests, who seemed surprised that the roses, unwilling to quit Olympus, would not descend on earth. The general effect of this fair chamber was heightened, too, by that regulation of the house which did not permit any benches in the ballroom. That dignified assemblage, who are always found ranged in precise discipline against the wall, did not here mar the flowing grace of the festivity. The chaperones had no cause to complain. A large saloon abounded in ottomans and easy chairs at their service, where their delicate charges might rest when weary, or find distraction when not engaged. All the world were at this fate of Sidonia. 
it exceeded in splendour and luxury every entertainment that had yet been given the highest rank even princes of the blood beauty fashion fame all assembled in a magnificent and illuminated palace resounding with exquisite melody coningsby though somewhat depressed was not insensible to the magic of the scene since the passage in the gardens of the luxembourg that tone that glance he had certainly felt much relieved happier and yet if it all were with regard to sidonia as unfounded as he could possibly desire where was he then had he forgotten his grandfather that fell look that voice of intense detestation what was millbank to him where what was the mystery for of some he could not doubt the spanish parentage of edith had only more perplexed coningsby it offered no solution there could be no connection between a catalan family and his mother the daughter of a clergyman in a midland county that there was any relationship between the millbank family and his mother was contradicted by the conviction in which he had been brought up that his mother had no relations that she returned to england utterly friendless without a relative a connection an acquaintance to whom she could appeal her complete forlornness was stamped upon his brain tender as were his years when he was separated from her he could yet recall the very phrases in which she deplored her isolation and there were numerous passages in her letters which alluded to it coningsby had taken occasion to sound the wallingers on this subject but he felt assured from the manner in which his advances were met that they knew nothing of his mother and attributed the hostility of mr millbank to his grandfather solely to political emulation and local rivalries still there were the portrait and the miniature that was a fact a clue which ultimately he was persuaded must lead to some solution coningsby had met with great social success at paris he was at once a favourite the parisian dame decided in his favour he was a specimen of the highest style of english beauty which is popular in france his air was acknowledged as distinguished the men also liked him he had not quite arrived at that age when you make enemies the moment therefore that he found himself in the saloons of sidonia he was accosted by many whose notice was flattering but his eye wandered while he tried to be courteous and attempted to be sprightly where was she he had nearly reached the ballroom when he met her she was on the arm of lord beaumanoir who had made her acquaintance at rome and originally claimed it as a member of a family who as the reader may perhaps not forget had experienced some kindnesses from the millbanks there were mutual and hearty recognitions between the young men great explanations where they had been what they were doing where they were going lord beaumanoir told coningsby he had introduced steeplechases at rome and had parted with sunbeam to the nephew of a cardinal coningsby securing edith's hand for the next dance they all moved on together to her aunt lady wallinger was indulging in some roman reminiscences with the marquis and you are not going to astrakhan to-morrow said edith not to-morrow said coningsby you know that you said once that life was too stirring in these days to permit travel to a man i wish nothing was stirring said coningsby i wish nothing to change all that i wish is that this fate should never end is it possible that you can be capricious you perplex me very much am i capricious because i dislike change but astrakhan it was the air of the luxembourg that reminded me of the desert said coningsby soon after this coningsby led edith to the dance it was at a ball that he had first met her at paris and this led to other reminiscences all most interesting coningsby was perfectly happy all mysteries all difficulties were driven from his recollection he lived only in the exciting and enjoyable present twenty-one and in love some time after this coningsby who was inevitably separated from edith met his host where have you been child said sidonia that i have not seen you for some days i am going to madrid to-morrow and i must think i suppose of cambridge 
Well, you have seen something. You will find it more profitable when you have digested it, and you will have opportunity. That's the true spring of wisdom. Meditate over the past. Adventure and contemplation share our being like night and day. The resolute departure for England on the morrow had already changed into a supposed necessity of thinking of returning to Cambridge. In fact, Coningsby felt that to quit Paris and Edith was an impossibility. He silenced the remonstrance of his conscience by the expedient of keeping a half-term, and had no difficulty in persuading himself that a short delay in taking his degree could not really be of the slightest consequence. It was the hour for supper. The guests at a French ball are not seen to advantage at this period. The custom of separating the sexes for this refreshment, and arranging that the ladies should partake of it by themselves, though originally founded in a feeling of consideration and gallantry, and with the determination to secure, under all circumstances, the convenience and comfort of the fair sex, is really, in its appearance and its consequences, anything but European, and produces a scene which rather reminds one of the harem of a sultan than a hall of chivalry. To judge from the countenances of the favoured fair, they are not themselves particularly pleased, and when their repast is over, they necessarily return to empty halls, and are deprived of the dance at the very moment when they may feel most inclined to participate in its grateful excitement. These somewhat ungracious circumstances, however, were not attendant on the festival of this night. There was opened in the Hotel of Sidonia, for the first time, a banqueting room which could contain with convenience all the guests. It was a vast chamber of white marble, the golden panels of the walls containing festive sculptures by Schwanthaler, relieved by encaustic tinting. In its centre was a fountain, a group of bacchantes encircling Dionysus, and from this fountain, as from a star, diverged the various tables from which sprang orange trees in fruit and flower. The banquet had but one fault. Coningsby was separated from Edith. The Duchess of Grand Cairo, the beautiful wife of the heir of one of the imperial illustrations, had determined to appropriate Coningsby as her cavalier for the moment. Distracted, he made his escape, but his wandering eye could not find the object of its search, and he fell prisoner to the charming Princess de Petitpois, a carless chieftain, whose witty words avenged the cause of fallen dynasties and a cashiered nobility. Behold a scene brilliant in fancy, magnificent in splendour, all the circumstances of his life at this moment were such as acted forcibly on the imagination of Coningsby. Separated from Edith, he had still the delight of seeing her the paragon of that bright company, the consummate being whom he adored, and who had spoken to him in a voice sweeter than a serenade, and had bestowed on him a glance softer than moonlight. The lord of the palace, more distinguished even for his capacity than his boundless treasure, was his chosen friend, gained under circumstances of romantic interest, when the reciprocal influence of their personal qualities was affected by no accessory knowledge of their worldly positions. He himself was in the very bloom of youth and health, the child of a noble house, rich for his present wants, and with a future of considerable fortunes entrancing love and dazzling friendship a high ambition and the pride of knowledge the consciousness of a great prosperity the vague daring energies of the high pulse of twenty-one all combined to stimulate his sense of existence which as he looked round him at the beautiful objects and listened to the delicious sounds seemed to him a dispensation of almost supernatural ecstasy about an hour after this the ballroom was still full, but the other saloons gradually emptying. Coningsby entered a chamber which seemed deserted, yet he heard sounds, as it were, of earnest conversation. It was the voice that invited his progress. He advanced another step, then suddenly stopped. There were two individuals in the room by whom he was noticed. They were Sidonia and Miss Milbank. They were sitting on a sofa. Sidonia holding her hand, and endeavouring, as it seemed, to soothe her. 
Her tones were tremulous, but the expression of her face was fond and confiding. It was all the work of a moment. Coningsby instantly withdrew, yet he could not escape hearing an earnest request from Edith to her companion that he would write to her. In a few seconds Coningsby had quitted the Hotel of Sidonia, and the next day found him on his road to England. End of chapter 8 End of book 6